everyone, and I'd like to welcome you, everyone, to tonight's meeting. Um, I'd remind you that tonight's meeting is being webcast, um, and so can members ensure that they speak to their microphone so that they can be heard on that webcast? Um, and I'm, I thank you, members, who are wearing their uh, Christmas attire this evening, um, as is customary at our, our December meeting. Um, and thank you for any donations you've made uh, or, or are making to the the uh, Chairman's Charity, which this year is Community Alliance, East Hearts and Broxbourne. Um, just to, to say that over the last couple of months, um, uh, I've represented East Hearts at a number of events, uh, civic events uh, across the county, but uh, within East Hearts as well. Uh, and in particular at the Remembrance Serv Day services in Bishop Stalford and Sawbridgeworth. And both of these were, were very moving services. Uh, and they serve to commemorate those who have lost their lives uh, in past conflicts and a reminder of the terrible conflicts of, of war. Um, I'd also like to, to thank the Deputy Chair uh, for laying the wreaths in uh, at uh, Wareham, Hartford, and for Councillor Walcombe, who laid the wreath uh, on my behalf in Buntingford. Another highlight um, during the last couple of months it was um, the Lights of Love service, which I attended on be, uh, that is arranged by Isabel Hospice in Bishop Stortford, which gives an opportunity um, for those who have been bereaved in the last year to uh, commemorate their loved ones that have passed um, and to give them an act of memory and a thanksgiving for their lives. And that was very a very moving service. Um, and the other thing that I would like to mention before passing to the, the leaders' announcements is to say that if any of you within your wards or your communities have events that you would like the chair or uh, the deputy chair to attend, then please uh, direct those people to uh, the um, page on the on the on the website, um, because I would be happy to attend where, wherever they're needed. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now pass to the the leader um, to to see whether you have any announcements. Uh, thank you, chair. Um, with the, with the year drawing to a close, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to say a few thank yous. Firstly, on behalf of the executive, uh, I want to thank all councillors here for your hard work. Since the elections, many of us have had to learn new skills and adapt quickly while delivering for our communities. I understand the challenges, I really do. And I'd like to thank all of you for your efforts. Secondly, I think I speak on behalf of all of us here in thanking the council officers and staff at East Hearts Council, who we know have worked tirelessly through significant changes this year to do their best for us and for our residents. I'm sure you'll join me in wishing them all a well-deserved and relaxing break over the Christmas period. Thank you. So do we have any apologies for absence? Yeah, we've received apologies for absence from Councillor Hollabon, Councillor Parsad Wyatt, Councillor Smith, Councillor Wilson, and Councillor Walkham. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we, we have before us the minutes of the meetings uh, held on the 18th of October, 2023. Uh, are there any amendments to those minutes? Okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Councillor Stone. I just referred to the question I raised at the last meeting, the way it was minuted, um, and because it was never answered. And if, you, if the question is read again, it's quite clear that I asked for some assurances for residents about the existing adopted sites and that they will be carried forward before more land was taken into um, the new revised district plan. Could we have something noting that that wasn't answered? You have you have a note of of, of the oh, the sorry it's the page twenty six my question, and then I believe the answer from Councillor Gavin Wall was on page twenty seven, and then um, but it was only answered in part. The, if the if the minutes give what the answer was on that occasion, 
then I can't say that it that it wasn't answered. You weren't satisfied with the answer. No, I, it, I didn't, didn't answer the points I made. That's what I'm saying. Mm. But it's, it's that's how it is. The, the minutes are the, the minutes of, of of the meeting as they were on on that evening. If 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 the words that were said were were not as you say, then then that's fine. But 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 you're not querying what was actually said. Only that you do not feel that it was answered on that that occasion. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Sorry, um, can I can I just raise a point on the same minute? My my understanding of that conversation in the last. Mm -hmm. In the last council was that Victoria Club Award promised us a three-month work program for the DMC. I think that is minuted. I don't recall seeing that. I'm sorry if it's if I've missed it, but I don't recall seeing that. So it's an action point arising. Okay. Thank you. I don't know whether you. Okay. So so that that is not on the accuracy of the minutes though. If that is minuted in the no, but obviously, <laughs> probably it's a three months work program and it hasn't come through. I mean, you know, well, we need to ask that about it. Need to, that would need to be followed up. Uh, Councillor Glover, Ward, do you want to respond to that? I thought I said we could look at having a three month work program. That can be reviewed. Okay, so if if there are no um, um, sorry. This is just playing words, isn't it? So on that basis, I think we'd like to know if you have looked at having a three-month work program, and if you have, what you've decided, and if you've decided that we can't have one because we haven't seen one, I'd like to know why. Uh, we have a three-month work program for internally on okay. planning. If you wanted a copy of it, I'm more than happy for that to be provided to you. Well, the answer obviously okay. is yes. Thank you. Yeah, at this particular point, we're talking about the accuracy of the minutes that were taken before. I think I think this can be taken up elsewhere. Um, so I, w I will um, ask our members content with the minutes as they're recorded. Uh, Councillor Goldsby. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd like to propose that we accept these minutes. Okay. Councillor Dar. I'd like to second that, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All those in favour? Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. So those those minutes are carried, and I will uh, sign those as a, as a as a record of the meeting. Does anyone have any declarations of interest? Councillor Goldsby. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, non-pecuniary interest. Um, agenda item thirteen: the petitions. Um, about asylum seekers and refugees. I am a coordinator for a refugee support group in Bishop's Talkford. Okay, thank you. It's non-pecuniary. Okay. So we have two petitions have been submitted. The lead petitioner uh, will have three minutes if, if you'd like to come forward. So the, the first, the first um, petition is with regard to Benji O'Field. Okay. Um, so you have three minutes to present the petition and then the relevant executive member will respond. Uh, there will be no debate on the item, but the relevant ward members may uh, speak at the end of the petition. So if you could start. Good evening. I'm afraid we are here again. My name is Heston Atwell and I care about local issues along, the, along with these people here today and thousands of others in Hartford and Benjo community. We have been fighting for the protection of Benjo Field for over seven years, and whilst we fully support building sustainable homes, Benjo Field is a wholly inappropriate place to do so. Here are some of the key reasons why we believe Benjo Field should be returned to Greenbelt and protected from further development. The field is much loved and used by our community for walking and cycling. You get a real sense of being in the countryside when you walk through it, and it's rich in wildlife. It's part of our local heritage and building 118 homes there will rob many of a daily delight. Building on Benjo Field will have a major impact on all local infrastructure. Hartford's roads, as you can see tonight, already struggle coping with the amount of traffic. At peak times, there are daily queues on Benjo Street and down onto Wades Mill Road opposite the proposed site. It is unlikely that new residents will walk to either of our true two train stations as they are not within easy walking distance, this will put further stress on our fragile road network. We have minimal shops in the area, so household shopping would involve car journeys into Hartford and beyond. 
GP and dental surgeries in and around Hartford are stretched at best. This development will further reduce the catchment area of Benjo Primary School. Children outside the catchment area in Benjo will be put into cars and driven across Hartford and beyond to school. Shouldn't every child have the right to walk to school? I certainly did. The local drainage infrastructure is over capacity due to new developments along Sackham Road over the last 15 years. The road is regularly flooded nearby the latest Stiles development which was built by the applicant. Another 118 homes which involve pumping foul and surface water into the already overloaded system on Sackham Road will increase flooding events. Pumping stations by their very nature do fail and this proposal stores sewage directly over Hartford's water supply putting it at major risk of pollution. East Arts District Council and the Benjo Neighbourhood Plan agreed to only support development where it protected natural areas and respect and enhance the character of the local landscape. We also aim to increase opportunities for walking and cycling. This proposal does the opposite and building homes here means habitat loss, increased pollution risk, overstretching still our fragile local infrastructure, our view, shared by the planning inspector who conducted a lengthy investigation into the matter, is that this field is of exceptional value, value to people who use it, not the quick and substantial monetary value to the landowners and developers. Our community, who you serve, will continue to fight for the protection of Benjo Field and return it to Greenbelt status, which we ask your support in doing so. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Glover Ward. I believe you have a response, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to respond to this petition. I do appreciate the strength of feeling that the community has about the part of Benjo Field, which forms a second phase of the Hart 4 District Plan Site allocation, and your strong wish to return it to the Greenbelt. As you know, the site was taken out of the Greenbelt and allocated for development when the district plan was adopted in 2018. National planning policy sets out that the Greenbelt boundaries should only be altered where exceptional circumstances are fully evidenced and justified through the preparation or updating of local, or in this case, district plans or neighbourhood plans. At the time, the district plan inspector considered whether exceptional circumstances existed to justify the proposed revisions to the Greenbelt boundary. He concluded that all options for locating development had been explored. Brownfield land had been assessed and prioritised. Significantly higher densities in urban areas had been discounted because of the harm to local character and a much larger range of smaller sites in the Greenbelt was also discounted because they could not bring forward the infrastructure necessary to support the quality of development required in our district. The inspector concluded that the studies carried out were comprehensive and demonstrated that, in the absence of any reasonable alternative, the release of Greenbelt land for development was needed for the district plan period and beyond to provide land for homes. Housing need was and continues to be acute in East Hearts, and the supply and suitability of land outside the Greenbelt is quite constrained. Without the release of land from the Greenbelt, there would simply not be enough available to provide sufficient homes to meet the needs of people within East Hearts. As such, the inspector was satisfied that exceptional circumstances did exist to justify the district plan strategy for delivering homes, including the release of land from the Greenbelt. In respect of the housing allocations in Hartford, including part of Bengio Field, the inspector concluded that sites were better located than the reasonable alternatives in terms of protecting the historic character of the town, access to facilities and deliverability. So he considered them to be sustainable options for housing. The inspector did, however, make a modification to policy HART 4 to require a defined and recognised boundary to the landscape necessary to mitigate impacts on the Greenbelt in accordance with the National Planning Policy Framework. Of course, at that time, the outcome of the minerals planning application was not known, as the district plan was adopted in October 2018, and the Secretary of State did not dismiss the planning application appeal until the 4th of April 2019. 
It should also be recognised that the Hartford site allocation lay outside and has never formed any part of the minerals application appeal site area and was not intended to do so. Furthermore, it should be noted that paragraph 428 of the inspector's report to the minerals application public inquiry stated that there is no convincing evidence that the implementation of the appeal scheme is necessary to enable future housing to comply with HART 4. So he was not questioning the appropriateness of the allocation itself. Significant community participation and stakeholder engagement was involved in the production of the district plan. The Council consulted extensively at each stage of the district plan's preparation, and so it is not correct to say that the Greenbelt designation was changed without any public consultation. The Council takes the views of the community very seriously, but at the same time is committed to meeting its housing need within the district. This has meant that some difficult decisions have had to be made. The Council is duty-bound to consider all planning applications that are submitted to it, and if a decision is not forthcoming, then the applicant could appeal against non-determination. This would then take the decision out of, local out of the local planning authority's hands and straight to the planning inspectorate. Therefore, if the Council wants to retain the planning decision locally, we cannot delay the determination of any platform planning application by putting it on hold. Similarly, similarly, the Council cannot consider amending designations by reinstating the Greenbelt outside of a district plan making process. And whilst the Council has agreed that the district plan should be updated, this will take several years and in the meantime planning applications will continue to be decided in line with the district plan 2018. Thank you again for the opportunity to respond to your concerns, but as I've set out, the decision to remove the site from the Greenbelt was consulted upon by East Hearts District Council and fully considered by the District Plan Inspector. So the Council is not in a position to pause or suspend planning decisions on the part of Benjir Field included in the Hart 4 allocation. It will therefore be up to the Council's Development Management Committee to consider the current application in line with mo both national and local planning policies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dar, I believe you wanted to speak on behalf of the, the Ward Councillors. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity, Chair and fellow Councillors, to speak about this petition. I speak on behalf of the three Ward District Councillors who represent the ward that Hart 4 sits in, Bengio. I possibly wouldn't be sitting here as a councillor if it weren't for this piece of land. It is my favourite bit of Bengio, as, as, as it is so close to the edge of Bengio and the views are amazing. It is an anchor to me to this area. I have high standards of what I consider to be a good view, having been brought up in Dover and regularly walking along the cliffs with the sea and France for my view. And I think this land compares well to that. From the time I moved to Bengio 25 years ago, I have walked across Bengio Field regularly and during lockdown almost daily. I spoke at the inquiry into the quarry held at County Hall and explained to the inspector why I did not believe the quarry should be allowed to go ahead. I therefore completely get the request from local residents for this land to be returned to the Greenbelt. Bengio residents fought so hard to overturn the quarry, only to find out that whilst their efforts were focused on this, the planning inspector allowed the land for Hart 4 to be taken out of the Greenbelt. What I sense from the hundreds of emails I have received is a sense of disbelief. In April 2019, the Secretary of State concluded that the landscape is of exceptionally high value when announcing the decision against the quarry. However, the earlier decision of the planning inspector to take the land for Hart 4 out of the green belt was based on the assumption that the quarry would take place and the special landscape destroyed. The whole sequence of events has not been good for residents' trust in democracy. I imagine the land for Hart 4 was offered to the planning inspector originally via the call for sites. It is very upsetting for residents to see that this particular part of the field was chosen. 
houses will be built on the beautiful rolling slopes of one side of the field. This means that the unique nature of Bengio Field will be destroyed. We all fear that it will not be long before the call to build houses across the field comes forward and the argument for the special unique nature of the field will have been destroyed by the development of Hart 4. The views from this field looking across Hartford are part of what makes it special. Those views which are so calming for the mind will not have the same effect for the walkers, runners and cyclists when there are houses in the way. I would like to suggest that if the landowners had consulted local residents before putting forward this land for the development, a compromise might have been, might have been found which preserved the special rolling nature of the field and views across Hartford. Due to the muddled timeline of decision making, I would suggest the wrong piece of land has been taken out of the green belt. The evidence can be seen on the planning portal in the response from the Environment Agency. They have objected to the current plan because it is too close to the borehole for the whole of Hartford for our drinking water. We have struggled to find any examples where land taken out of Greenbelt has later been returned to Greenbelt. However, if there ever was a strong case for revisiting the decision to remove land from the Greenbelt, I believe this is it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dart. Um, the second petition relates to um, the swimming pool in, in Buntingford and Mr Wiley, if you would like to present the petition. Thank you, councillors. Um, within just three weeks, close to 2,000 people have signed a physical and an online petition objecting to the decision to close Ward Freeman School, or Ward Freeman Pool, sorry, I'd like to appeal on behalf of those um, signatures that the council take notice of the objections. Also, I think you should be aware there is a requirement in the national curriculum for schools to provide swimming instruction. There are actually over 1,100 children in the four schools in Buntingford, and there are also over 1,200 children in Puckeridge and the surrounding villages, all within five miles of the Ward Freeman Pool. Closing the pool makes achieving curriculum requirements difficult to fulfill and will certainly be more costly and environmentally damaging. Also, I think the council should be aware that there were 270, 277 people drowned in the UK in 2022. For children between four, five and 14, drowning is actually one of the top 10 causes of death. By removing the funding, for Ward Freeman's pool, the council will be responsible for more children not being able to swim and potentially for deaths. So this is something fairly serious. There's been a long-standing lack of maintenance of the Ward Freeman pool and its facilities. The pool cover, the air circulation system have not worked for a number of years. A leak in the pool was addressed by closing off part of the filtration system and circulation system and this was not a long-term fix, but there are now no leaks. Cracked and bro broken tiles have been fixed on a temporary basis, and these issues could be addressed in an economic way if there was a will. The water heating and the filtration systems are old and very inefficient. The tiles are cracking in places, but I've received an indicative quote this morning suggesting that these issues could be addressed for less than £330,000. Is this beyond the budget of the Council? Against this backdrop, in financial year 22-23, there was a 1.1 million fund in the East, District, East Hearts District Council capital expenditure budget for award premium pool refurbishment and gym addition. The community at that time thought that there was a plan in place to enhance the Ward Freeman pool and its facilities. There has now been a sudden decision to close the pool. A large number of people are, were not even aware of the decision because on the 28th of November, the executive committee ratified the closure and last week there were still no notices on the pool doors. Mr. In Wally, 
I'm, I'm afraid you've had your, your three minutes, but if you could just um, okay. finish up, please. So I, I think this is a pretty much a slap in the face for the people in Buntingford. Over the last 10 years, the population there has grown by 50%. So there has been an increase in income from the area, and both the councils seem very determined to shut a very vital facility and force people who want to use a pool to drive 15 miles at least, so that's a 30 mile round trip, to Harton Pool. I think this p petition urges the council that it should think again. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, the executive member for the wellbeing will respond. Thank you, and thank you for sharing your petition, um, which I've also been keeping an eye on. And I've heard the passion in your voice and I've had so many emails from people in Buntingford just telling me how important this pool is, how it's helped them recover from um, sort of injury, how it's helped them maintain activity um, when other forms of physical activity weren't available. Um, many people, just like you yourself have said, are deeply concerned about children being able to learn how to swim and also people without transport um, being able to access um, other facilities outside of Buntingford. Um, just to kind of sort of um, explain a little bit, the, the reason the pool has um, been put, put forward to close um, at the end of term is for health and safety reasons. You've, you've highlighted a number of issues with the pool. Um, the filtration system is um, well beyond its expected shelf life. There's damage to the pipework in the filtration system, which has resulted in a low flow rate and poor circulation. There are also several cracks in other areas, and the pool plant is obsolete and requires replacement. For some time, there has been additional microbiology testing to ensure that the water is safe, but obviously concerns about obsolete equipment continue to grow, and it reached a point where everyone active, our contractors, don't feel comfortable with the level of potential risk. To continue knowingly operates with equipment that's become out of date, severely out of date, puts not just the users at risk, but also the providers at significant risk, including risk of pro prosecution. As a council, safety also has to be our priority, and we do not want to wish anyone to become sick. However, obviously underlying this closure is the cost involved in fixing the filtration system. So the quote that we've been provided, and thank you for the updated quote that you found, um, the quote we've been provided to, to fix these issues is near enough half a million pounds or, or just over, and will also require draining the pool to fix the filtration system, which brings with it the risks of the size collapsing, which would add considerably to the cost. The pool tank also is a suspected large crack and the boiler desperately needs replacing. To bring the pool up to a good standard realistically would cost far more, it's probably closer to a million. Responsibility for Ward Freeman has shared with Hertfordshire County Council and capital work such as these needs agreement from both parties. In 2017, Ward Freeman was identified to receive investment and improvement. Money for these upgrades was set aside in 2020, but the repairs did not happen as agreement between the two then conservative led councils could not be reached. Money was moved to 2021 and then to 2022, but again, repairs did not happen. At the last budget setting prior to our administration, spend for Ward Freeman was removed from the committed budget. The spend became approved but not committed and was moved to the year 25-26. The Green Lib Dem administration inherited an extremely challenging financial situation and extensively, extensive costly investment commitments. We are required to save £6 million over the next four years, and County has to save £10 million this year alone. As upsetting as it is, we have looked extensively at the current finances, and we simply don't have the money available to fund in full these repairs, which are now much more severe than when they were identified all those years ago. Whilst it is little comfort, Buntingford is not the only town to feel they've missed out on capital spend with many residents from other towns feeling also angered at seeing expensive projects in two larger towns, yet little coming their way. I'm also aware that people have asked about various pots, including the Swimming Pool Support Fund, money from Section 106, and money received by the pool in Fakenham. For brevity, I won't go into those details here, but my written response will include full details as to why these could not be used for Ward Freeman. 
With all that said, while the councils are jointly not in a position to fund these repairs, it's very clear just how much this facility means. I, like you, feel it is crucial that we do whatever possible to try and salvage this pool. I've been looking into a range of options outside of council funding that could help secure future funding for this pool. Along with Buntingford Ward councillors and residents of Buntingford, we're working closely to see what other options might be available. I'd like to say at this point it's been heartwarming to see so many offers of help and support from residents keen to bring this facility back into use. There are several grant pots that local authorities are not eligible to apply for, but charities and community groups are. And a survey is now in development to help understand what might improve revenue should the pool reopen. In addition to this, whilst not able to fully fund the costs, East Hearts Council officers and councillors are keen to see what will be possible in terms of financially supporting the upgrades and the project itself if it is able to open in the future. I am of course under no illusion that this will be a challenging project and that on sur further surveying of the building, problems could well emerge that might render the site unviable. However, we want to ensure that we have explored every avenue. The petition clearly shows the value of this pool and all the comments will not go to waste as they're keen to demonstrating a case for funding when developing grant applications. The petition also speaks to the wider issue of swimming pools nationally and the urgent need nationally to protect these vital assets. We also have an email list for people who would like to be kept up to date and I'd be happy to add anyone to the list. There's a plan for a meeting in March next year to bring updates when hopefully we have a lot more information as to our options available in the future. Um, but I just emphasize again, we really are keen to do everything possible. Thank you again for presenting your petition. Thank you, Councillor Hopewell. If there are if no comments from the ward councillors at this point, oh, Councillor Burt. Um, hello, yes, I am speaking on behalf of the ward councillors of Bundingford, and we completely understand the anger of the closure of the pool. Bundingford is a growing town, and we are losing more and more of our facilities. Councillor Nichols and I are both directly affected as our children are swim have swimming lessons there. As uh, Mr Wiley has already said, there has been very little maintenance on the pool and anyone who has visited the pool over the far past five to ten years are well aware of how run down it has become due to neglect and only basic upgrades, for example a carpet laid in the foyer and tiles being replaced. The ward councillors and councillor Sarah Hopewell have had a number of meetings with local residents and we are pleased and grateful for the support and positivity when it comes to various possibilities such as becoming a community asset or having charitable status so that we can do our best to ensure that a swimming pool remains in Bunsenford despite the closure by the council. I'd like to thank everyone involved for your petition and support when it comes to keeping this facility in our town. And I'd also like to thank Sarah because I know she's done a huge amount of work in finding out about um, possible funding and of course liaising with the residents. So thank you very much and thank you for the petition. Thank you, Councillor Burt. Uh, I'm there. I'm Point afraid. Pardon. Uh, point you. I've exchanged emails with the executive member for the release of the uh, report. I, and I was told um, it was confidential and it couldn't be released. This evening, the executive member has released the information contained within that document. So sorry, can I sorry, ask for that yeah. document to be released? Sorry, Councillor, can I ask you, you, you said point of order, but I don't, I've not seen a point of order. The confidentiality of the report. She's released the confidentiality of the report in this report. Would it be a point of information? Yeah, to be taken outside of this um, arena, I would have thought, because this yeah. is a petition and that the, 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 the speaking arrangement for petitions is set up quite clearly in the Constitution. Um, so perhaps something to be taken outside of this arena. Right. Who do I take that up with you? Okay. Th thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if we can move to uh, public questions. Um, there are eight questions that have been submitted. Um, may I remind members of the public um, that both the questioner and the responding executive member must ensure that the question and the reply is succinct. And the total time al allowed for consideration of any question submitted shall not exceed 15 minutes. 
given the fact that we now publish the full responses the day after this meeting, short verbal responses are to be encouraged so that we may keep to the time limit. Uh, now, we've had eight, eight questions uh, submitted. I believe the only one of those questioners who is here this evening is Mr. Wiley. So I would invite him to ask his question first. Uh, this was a question for Sarah Hopewell. Um, I was just looking for clarification of when and what the serious health and safety issues were that were raised by everyone active, which led to the decision to close the pool. Uh, has a full and an independent evaluation been undertaken of ways to address these serious health and safety issues? Because as far as I have seen, there has not been. Councillor Hobart. Thank you for your question. Um, there have been concerns about Ward Freeman Pool for quite some time now, and an independent survey was commissioned earlier this year, which identified a range of urgent issues. These included damaged pipework in the filtration system, which has resulted in a low flow rate and poor circulation, severe cracks in scum channels, and pool plant which is non-compliant and requires replacement. The report was shared with officers in May 23 and following discussions, increased testing of water and visual inspections were introduced. In September this year, an email from everyone active director highlighted further concerns. As a leisure provider, there are strict operating criteria and no company would wish to risk either health of users or prosecution. Due to heightened concerns, um, everyone active requested assurances from East Hearts Council that the necessary improvement works would be carried out within three months at the latest. Due to the ongoing financial pressure and inability to reach agreements with the freeholders, Hertfordshire County, Hertfordshire County Council officers were, un, sorry, with the freeholders, Hertfordshire County Council officers were unable to give these assurances. As a result of continuing dialogue with the contractors, weighing up the potential health and safety risks, the decision was taken to close the pool so further investigation can be undertaken safely and without any risk to the public. Officers have agreed to further explore all options and report back to the executive members by the end of March 24. Okay, thank you. You are allowed a supplementary, Mr Wani, if you wish to ask one. Um, yes, I was just wondering whether uh, th that report could be made public because so far it hasn't been. I've asked for it on several occasions and been told I couldn't see it. So the report that I sent to um, Councillor McAndrew in its current format, while well, I've provided some of the details here, there's some commercially sensitive information that, that would need to be removed. I know we've exchanged emails about this and um, Yes, I mean, hopefully that that is something that we will be able to provide soon. We just I just haven't had the opportunity to to do that fully, but yes, hopefully soon. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. So I will now um, return to the question one, um, as there are no further members of the public here to answer, ask their questions, uh, and I will read out the questions, um, starting with the question from Colin Woodward to Councillor Ben Crystal, the leader of the council. Uh, in September 2022, EHDC formally recognised the Water Lane Hall to be an asset of community value, yet the perception in Bishop Stortford is that the council is still intent on proceeding with the proposal to dispose of the hall, along with its other assets on the Old River Lane site, by transferring them to City Heart for development of the site for a paltry sum, or possibly at nil cost in the case of the hall compared with the cost of the council, uh, to the council of their purchase. In the meantime, there has twice been an extension of the lease of the hall to the URC church, demonstrating its ongoing utility and value to the community. Though without any reason to reply to alternate bids, such as that made on that, that of the 17th of March 2023, submitted by Community Initiative Bishop Stortford and Bishop Stortford Civic Federation, setting out several ownership and operating scenarios to preserve this asset. Given that Water Lane Hall was designated an EHC by EHC as an asset of community value, what process is EHDC 
now following to allow the community the option to retain the building for community use, noting its, the Council's, own priorities including CFLL 8, before it takes an irrevocable irrevoc decision to hand it over to City Heart, potentially for demolition. If you can respond, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Mr Woodward for his question and for reminding us about Waterhall Lane's ongoing value for the community. As we know, the United Reformed Church leases the building and is responsible for the hiring of the hall and management of bookings. We hope that groups that currently use the hall will be able to continue doing so for the foreseeable future. East Hearts Council's medium-term financial plan and budget proposals are due to go to the executive at a meeting on the 21st of December. In those papers, to be published imminently, a sum of around £170,000 has been earmarked for maintenance works of Water Lane Hall. As the budget proposals will explain in more detail, we intend to keep the hall operational for continued community use until timescales for building the Arts Centre become clear. Thank you. So moving to question two from Gil, Jill Goldsmith to Councillor Carl Britton, uh, Executive Member for Financial Sustainability. It is now four months since my last question uh, on the HDC's accounts and hence the audited values of assets on the ORL site. As of the 5th of December, the council website is not disclosing the accounts for 2021, which were completed months ago and the inspection period has not commenced for the 2021-22 unaudited accounts. The 2022-23 accounts have also missed the statutory deadline. It is my understanding that as yet no contract exists with City Heart but that the terms of the potential contract, a development management agreement, could, could go back to value set with City Heart when City Heart was selected as preferred development partner, which is nearly five years ago now. So the values then may not reflect best value now. The answer to me in July 2023 was that the council would not in, enter into an agreement with a developer whereby we are not getting best value. And the, and the frequently asked questions on the council's website say that an updated section 123 report with independent values will be produced and agreed before the evaluation is signed. Given the, important scheme, the, the importance of this scheme for the town and for the council's finance, residents need to be able to see how the council is justifying the transfer of the assets before the development agreement is signed. So the question is, how, how, the, how is the council now obtained uh, independent valuations for the ORL site and will it make this information and related section 123 explanations transparent before the development management agreement is signed? Councillor Britton, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to Jill Goldson for the question. The Council's accounts for 2021 received an audit opinion on 16th of March 2023. There has been widespread failure of local public audits since the ab abolition of the Audit Commission. In England, 100% of audits are performed now by private sector auditors and there are huge audit backlogs. In Scotland and Wales, 70% of audits are conducted by public sector auditors and there are no delays. The Council is not in any way to blame for these delays. Our appointed auditors are simply unable to find staff to undertake the audits. The 21-22 accounts audit has been underway and despite a promise that the audit would be completed in November, it remains incomplete and we have no date yet for when it is likely to be finished. For the 2022-23 audit, we've been told by auditors that depending on the course of action the government takes, they will either do no work on the 2023 audit and it will remain unaudited, or they will do enough work to disclaim an opinion. As it stands, there is a very real chance our 2022-23 accounts may never be audited. I stress again, this is not the fault of the Council. If you're hoping to see Old River Lane showing as a line in the fixed assets disclosures with a value attached to them, then I have to disappoint you and say that it does not appear as a line on its own. An updated Section 123 report has not yet been produced. In any case, this will not be published before the development agreement is signed, as it is likely to prejudice our commercial interests and thus be exempt under Section 43 of the Freedom of Information Act. The Section 151 officer is charged with the proper administration of the Council of Financial Affairs 
and he will commission the Section 123 report as he has to certify that the disposal was for best value under the general disposal consents issued by the Secretary of State. Thank you. Given the risks to the financial sustainability of all local authorities, I doubt very much that any officer would allow the sale of an asset for less than best value. We have experienced some IT issues updating the web pages with the accounts, but copies of the 2020 and 2021 accounts, 21-22 accounts and 22-23 accounts can be emailed to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, I think this will probably be the last question that can be asked, um, and I would appreciate a very, very short answer. Um, so from Charlotte Lipscomb to Councillor Vicky Glover Ward, the Executive Member for Planning and Growth. Um, in the Council meeting held on the 18th of October, I asked the Executive Member responsible for licensing a question regarding the chaos created by the Amherst Festival held in Berry Green on the, on the 2nd of September. Um, in her reply, she indicated an, uh, an investigation was launched immediately after the event. Uh, I'll skip to the question itself, which is, it is now well over three months since the event and two months since she made that statement. Residents like me are still expecting answers. Can the executive member please confirm when the results of the investigation and the action that may be taken against the event organisers will be made public? The Council's investigation into possible breaches of the premises licence for Amherst has nearly reached a conclusion. Officers have kept me up to date on progress and this week, officers have fed back preliminary results to the Chair of the Licensing Committee and myself. We expect to conclude the matter by Friday, the 22nd of December 2023, at which point the licence holder will be informed of the outcome. I, anticipating, I anticipate writing to Little Haddam Parish Council to provide an overview of the outcome, but we will be unable to share all details due to confidentiality. We have also offered to attend a parish council meeting with our licensing services man manager to discuss the outcome. We would anticipate that once we have confirmed the outcome um, to the parish council, we will also be able to share a broad brush confirmation of our actions. But I would prefer to notify the parish council first as elected representatives. Okay, thank you. And I think we have reached the end of the 15 minutes allotted. So for those questions that were not asked, um, a written response will be will be issued and will be on the website in the morning. Um, okay, if we can move to members' questions, of which there are uh, seven uh, have been submitted, and I will uh, again remind members that both the questioner and responding executive member must ensure that the question and reply is succinct, and the total time allowed for consideration of any question submitted will not exceed 15 minutes. Given the fact that we now publish the full responses the day after this meeting, short verbal responses are to be encouraged so that we can keep within the time limit. Any remaining questions not dealt with within this time will be published on the website as soon as possible after the meeting. So taking the questions in the order submitted, may I ask um, Councillor Ian Devonshire uh, to ask his question? Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Executive Member for Planning and Growth. Please could you let us know why there have been so few development management committees since the election in May of this year. Up to the end of November, there had only been two DMC meetings in seven months. It was reported last year that this authority was the ninth busiest planning authority in the country. Therefore, it is very worrying that we are having so few DMC meetings. Development management committee is obviously very important to demonstrate transparency in the planning process so please, can the executive member explain why applications are not coming to DMC? Thank you for your question, Councillor Devonshire. As you have mentioned, the council has a very busy planning department and we receive around 2,500 planning applications a year. The majority of these applications are minor household-related applications and are determined under delegated authority by our officers. We receive around 50 major planning applications a year, although this can vary. Not all of these applications are considered by DMC, but we do currently have a number of important planning applications in the system, such as Birchall Garden Suburb, Where 2, Heart 3 and Heart 4, which will be considered by DMC at the appropriate time. 
major planning applications are generally more complex, with us receiving a huge number of comments on them alongside needing to resolve several technical planning matters. This all takes time, and in most cases they can't be determined within the statutory timeframes. To manage this, we have planning performance agreements, known as PPAs, in place with the applicants to guide them through the process and more realistic timeframes. Officers will only present applications to DMC for consideration when they consider that the planning issues have been resolved and they can recommend a robust planning decision. This means that on some occasions, applications won't quite be ready to be considered by DMC and meetings will have to be cancelled. Having looked back at the DMC agenda since May 2019, I can see this approach is not uncommon, with between four and six meetings per year having been cancelled during this period. Whilst there have been some DMC meetings, well, there have been some DMC meetings that have had to be cancelled this year because there is no business for reasons I've outlined. There are a number of applications that will need to be considered by DMC in 2024. The officer team have an indicative three monthly forward plan that they work towards, but as I've highlighted previously, this can change for reasons outside of our control. And it is important to ensure that we encourage quality applications to be presented and considered by DMC. Thank you. Councillor Devonshire, would you like to ask a supplementary? Yes, please, Chair. Um, to put this into context, during the same time period, May to November, North Arts District Council, a comparably sized authority and on our border, had eight DMC meetings compared to our two. Is there any possibility that applications will be going to the planning inspectorate on the grounds of non-determination, losing local control, especially around Section 106 contributions? No. Um, but what I can tell you comparing to East Hearts, in 2022 to, 22 to April 2022 to March 2023, there were six meetings cancelled. And in April 2020 to March 2021, there were five. Um, we're expecting to have a very full programme next year. Um, but given that we had an election in May, so we had a, a DMC programmed for about 10 days after that, that one I think is understandably cancelled. Um, and the remainder um, are, have been because there haven't been planning applications ready for them. Thank you. Uh, can I invite uh, Councillor Eric Buckmaster to, to ask his question? Please. Thank you, Chairman. And the question is for Councillor Vicky Clover Ward. Following the disappointing news that this council is closing Ward Freeman Swimming Pool, concerns have been raised yet again by a number of residents about the current condition and future status of the two other joint use pools in the district, including Leavenport Leisure Centre in Sawbridgeworth, which is in desperate need of refurbishment. In August, an unnamed spokesperson for the council was quoted in the Bishop Stortford Independent, stating that 50% of the allocated £122,000 of Section 106 money from the Sorb 2 and Sorb 3 housing developments, which was ring-fenced in the agreements for Grange Paddocks and or Leaventhorpe Leisure Centre remains unassigned. As Grange Paddocks is now complete, open and operation, operational, could the executive member for planning and growth confirm that this unassigned £60,000 will be spent on refurbishing Leaventhorpe Leisure Centre, which will help to attract additional users and therefore ensure its continued operation for the benefit of all the residents in Sawbridgeworth. Just to be clear, this is about the user experience, poor side, changing rooms, not repairs and maintenance. To be further clear, nobody, nobody in the previous Conservative administration gave any direction or set any policy to stop or reduce yeah. repairs and maintenance. Excuse me, I think you've gone beyond the, the, the question there. Uh, well, I, I, Chairman, please indulge me. Given what's been said already during the course of this meeting, I think the context is important. And, it, and my question did include uh, what's happened to Buntingford. Um, so I, I will, I'll stop there, um, but that's the point I was making, that there was no direction to stop um, repairs and maintenance okay. on any health and safety issues. 
Members will be aware that Section 106 funding can only be allocated in accordance with the identified contribution wording, and the Council has 10 years in which to allocate and use the received funds. Therefore, the identify, identified indoor sport and recreation contributions from the SORB, B2, SORB 2 development, which is either, for either Grange Paddocks and or Leventhorpe, are required to be allocated and used by 2034. So we have time to ensure the best use of this funding for the benefit of the council, the residents and the pool users. Councillor Buckmaster, do you have a supplementary? I, I do. I had some more context, but clearly you're not going to allow me to do that. But you got the point about what I was saying earlier. Um, that's not really much of an answer. The residents at Sawbridge were, would really want something done. Um, so my question specifically to Leventhorpe is this. Given the fact there are 13 years remaining on the joint use agreement, that the education and science funding for pools has not ceased, that there is Section 106 funding available for improvements from the Sawbridgeworth developments, that the service as a whole is viable with gym and pool usage much higher than pre-COVID, and the leisure provider is willing to consider extensions of the current contract beyond 2025, will the administration confirm support to encourage the use of Leventhorpe pool and gym by using funding available, maintaining and improving the health and well-being of residents of Sawbridgeworth and the surrounding area as soon as possible. This is really needed. The service as a whole is returning an in income, and that was the whole point of the investments made across the leisure service. So we need this done as soon as possible for Leventhorpe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I understand your question. However, I think it would have been better directed to Councillor Sarah Hopewell, for, who is the Executive Member for Wellbeing. I cannot comment on the leisure strategy as that would be for her to comment on. And I will seek a written answer from her after this meeting on that specific point. I think there wasn't anything in there about Section 106 funding other than that it was ex extant, which I think I've already answered. Um, not to my satisfaction, as long as that's noted, Chairman. That, that's noted, but 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 uh, you've had the, the, the one supplementary. If we move on to um, uh, um, question three, and may I invite Councillor Joseph Dumont to ask his question. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, local councils, including this one, have responsibility for licensing dog breeders and ensuring puppies are bred in safe and healthy conditions. Illegal puppy farms, in which large numbers of litters are bred in poor conditions, often without proper monitoring, continue to be used throughout the UK. <clears throat> it is estimated that 400,000 farm puppies are purchased each year. Does the executive member have any intelligence on the scale of the issue in the East Hearts, and what steps is this council taking to make sure the public is aware of the importance of acquiring puppies from licensed breeders? I'd like to thank Councillor Dumont for his question and I do understand and agree that animal welfare is something that many of our residents are very concerned about. Promoting the welfare of animals, including ensuring that dog breeders are licensed, is the responsibility of the Council's environmental health team. Over the last four years, the team have been contacted twice by members of the public concerned that a puppy farm was operating in their area. On both occasions, the allegation was investigated by an environmental health officer. In the first instance, there was no breeding found to be taking place. The officer provided general animal welfare advice and no further complaints were received. The second case was more of a concern and so the environmental health team brought in the RSPCA and Hertfordshire County Council's trading standards team to work with them. During the investigation, the owner of the establishment unfortunately died. This resulted in all of the dogs being rehomed by the RSPCA and dog breeding ceasing. Officers are keeping in contact with the establishment with the aim of ensuring no illegal activity takes place in the future. The animal welfare page on the council's website includes detailed advice and information about dog breeding, both for those considering breeding dogs and prospective purchasers of puppies. The website includes a link to the government's extensive information about the topic, as well as a form for contacting the environmental health team with any concerns about illegal or unsafe activity. I believe that although the problem is thankfully small in East Hearts, the Council is doing its best to inform breeders and 
public alike about safe puppy breeding. I would urge members hearing of any possible illegal activity to contact our environmental health team as a matter of urgency. Councillor Dumont, do you have a supplementary? Um, thank you very much, Sarah, for, for, that, for that answer. I know there's a lot of important things being discussed tonight. With the spike or the huge increase in dog ownership, especially since lockdown, this is another one. And it also demonstrates the wide responsibilities we have as a council. Um, so there's no real supplementary question, but it's a bit pertinent this time of year. Would Can you be, agree with me that dogs are for life, not Can for Christmas? Councillor Dumont, if there is no question, oh, then... Uh, <laughs> and you interrupted well, me. Well, you said, there, you said there was no supplementary questions. So, so, a little so. bit. Yes, we'll move on. OK, thank you. Uh, the, the next question that I have a question for is... Uh, Councillor John Wiley. But perhaps I should just learn to speak over you like, like others. Perhaps mm. that's what I should be doing. Uh, so, Councillor, Councillor Wiley, um, uh, do thank you, you chair wish to ask, you, ask your question? Uh, yeah, I think I know what the answer is going to be. But um, I, so I'll, I'll give a very pot, uh, sort of short version of it. Some Bishop Stortford High Street businesses struggle with staff recruitment and retention due to the proximity of Stansted Airport, where many employees get free parking. The executive member for environmental sustainability published a scheme in July, which was supported by the bid. Could the executive, sorry, at the full council on the 18th, the leader said a scheme, a new scheme was being um, introduced. Can the executive member tell me what the proposed new scheme is and when it will be launched? About half an hour. <laughs> and, and if you hold your breath, we'll go through it in some detail. That, thank you very much. I thought that may be the, the question. Do you a have quick, a, a, quick, so, a quick supplementary? Um, first of all, I would genuinely like to thank the executive member for uh, the initial um, proposal. I think that was something that did actually tick lots of boxes and pleased lots of people. I believe it was then called in by a member. Does the executive member regret that the initial project was called in? No, far from it. I think um, that's how the process works. Um, the wording on a non-key decision when it's circulated is for comment. Comments are received. Um, you take a judgment as to whether you react to those comments and what you do with those comments. My decision was that we should call it in and review the, the content. And we, we've come up with, I believe, is a more um, a, a more fair, more fair, a fairer um, proposal, which um, no doubt you'll have some input into when we get there. OK, thank you, Councillor Hoskin. Um, I'm afraid that that is the end of the 15 minutes. Um, those, those questions that weren't asked will receive written responses in the morning. So, so thank you for those mem to those members. And if we move on to the leaders, uh, to the executive report, rather. Um, so the report relates to the meeting of the executive on the 28th of November. 2023, and may I invite the leader to present his report. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you say, uh, the next item, is, actually there are four items within this, uh, this report, um, and they relate to the 28th of November executive meeting. Uh, the first one, which is the mandating card payment facilities in licensed vehicles, is uh, falls under the, uh, the portfolio of Councillor Vicky Glover-Ward. Uh, and so I'm going to hand over to her uh, to cover this and the subsequent three items. Uh, so over to the exec member for, for uh, planning and growth. Yeah. Good evening. Um, the key purpose of the Hackney Carriage and Private Hire licensing regimes is to ensure public safety. This proposed policy to mandate card payment facilities in all licensed vehicles will help to ensure that people will have more options to be able to pay for their hackney carriage or private hire vehicle and get to their chosen destination safely. Just to be clear, there is no intention to remove the ability to take cash by drivers and the card payment system is intended to be an additional payment system. In March of this year, the East Hearts licensed trade were surveyed regarding the use of card payment facilities. 97 responses received and 95% of the respondents already operated card payment facilities. The survey results are Appendix A. In May of this year, the licensed trade were formally consulted regarding the policy to mandate the provision of card payment facilities. This consultation document included the proposed wording for the policy and a link to an online survey to respond. When the survey closed on the 31st of May, 34 responses had been received. 
The consultation wording and responses to the formal consultation are in Appendix B. Several possible issues with the policy were raised in the responses and those are addressed within the report. In addition to the online survey responses, two licensed drivers sent in additional emails which raised similar issues to those that have been raised via the online survey. The additional responses are in Appendix C. Overall, 76% of the responses to the formal consultation were supportive of the policy and 94% already had card facilities, which is a very similar figure to that found through the informal survey. Appendix D shows the consideration given to the comments from the licensing committee, comments from myself and officers regarding the points raised and what action, if any, was taken as a result. The final proposed wording following this lengthy process is contained within Appendix E. You will see that the wording of the policy makes compliance a requirement from the 1st of April next year with the three month transition period to allow drivers to source a card payment system if they don't already have one. And that's proposed to start from the 1st of January 2023. Originally, the idea for compulsory card readers came from an inquiry from the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner who had raised it as a safeguarding concern. The East Hearts Licensing Service Manager, who is also the chair of the Hearts and Beds Licensing Group, surveyed Hertfordshire local authorities and found that two had mandated card payment facilities, St Albans and Watford. Bringing this policy in will mean that three local authorities have the same criteria, which we will then try and encourage county-wide. I uh, would like to ask um, the council to um, endorse the um, recommendation from exec to um, approve the policy. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a seconder for that recommendation? Councillor Goldsbank. Yes, Chairman. I'm happy to second this proposal. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Are there... Does any member wish to comment or ask a question? No, well, that's that's uh, good. So if we can then move to a vote. Uh, can I see a show of hands for those who are in favour of this proposal? And any against? And any abstentions? So I will declare that to be carried. And we move on to item 9B the Watternut Stone Neighbourhood Plan. Um, I'm really delighted to be bringing the first of two neighbourhood plans before council this evening, as this shows just how engaged our residents are in our wonderful district. Watternut Stone Parish Council have taken a proactive approach to meeting the district plan housing requirements for the village, as this is the first neighbourhood plan in East Hearts to release land from the green belt with the allocation of two strategic sites. This meets and exceeds the required growth, thereby delivering significant community benefits. In addition to housing allocations, the neighbourhood plan includes local green spaces, protected views and new pedestrian and cycle links, which will contribute towards sustainable development in, Wat in Watternut Stone. In the examination report, the examiner concludes that the neighbourhood plan is of a very high quality, with particular emphasis on it being well researched, well evidenced and clearly laid out. The support of the community is demonstrated at the referendum in October with 95% of votes in favour of the plan. It is therefore considered that the neighbourhood plan will be a positive addition to the East Hearts development management process and I'm proposing that the Watternut Stone neighbourhood plan is formally made by this council. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a seconder for that recommendation? Yes, I'd like to second and I reserve my right to speak. Okay, thank you, Councillor Thomas. Uh, are there any members who wish to uh, ask a question or to comment on this item? Uh, Councillor Crystal. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to congratulate the uh, the team uh, behind the, the neighbourhood plan. I think they did a fantastic job and it's a, it's a great result um, and they deserve uh, full credit for their hard work. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Thomas. Yes, I'd yeah. just like to echo the leader's uh, thanks. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Uh, eight years ago, I believe, the neighbourhood plan started. I was a young boy going into that first consultation meeting, thinking to myself, like many others, you know, there's 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 no there's no way that you know they're going to get through. For ten ten years ago, Watson at Stone had a new housing development, promises made, promises broken. 
um, you know, the people in Watton had lost faith in in us as a council. Um, and the way that the neighbourhood and steering group have brought the community along with them, um, I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn here as a council. So I should implore everyone to uh, vote to a formally adopt a plan. Okay. Thank you. Um, so if there are no other contributions, um, the recommendation to council is to adopt the Watton at Stone Neighbourhood Area Plan 2017 to 2033. Um, Members, can I have a show of hands of those who are in favour of accepting that recommendation? Thank you. Are there any against? Are there any abstentions? No, I'm pleased to say that that is, uh, that is unanimous and has been carried. So we move to item 9C. Um, the second of our neighbourhood plans this evening is the Ware Neighbourhood Plan. This plan has a clear focus on consolidating the role and the attractiveness of the town centre. It designated designates a package of local green spaces and includes policies to preserve the heritage and character of the town. It does not allocate sites for development, but seeks to provide opportunities for sustainable development within a context which maintains the distinct historic and natural environment in Ware. In the examination report, the examiner concludes it is an excellent neighbourhood plan for the town and addresses an important set of issues. He particularly praised the presentation of the plan and the way in which the supporting text underpins the policies which will assist decision makers. At the referendum in September, 91% voted in favour of, of using the neighbourhood plan to help decide applications in the neighbourhood area. It is therefore considered that the neighbourhood plan will be a positive addition to the East Hearts development management process and I'm proposing that the Ware neighbourhood plan is formally made by this council. Thank you. Is there a seconder for that recommendation? Councillor Dumont, do you wish to speak? Okay. Are there, uh, do any other members wish to comment or ask a question? Uh, Councillor Hart. I wanted to ask 90%, 91% of how many people? How many people actually voted in the referendum? It was a relatively low turnout. I think it was only about 16%, but I can check for you. Yeah, the only reason why I asked that is because I live in Ware and it wasn't terribly well advertised. In fact, my neighbour came and said, what is the neighbourhood plan? So I just feel there is a point to be made about inclusion and getting our message out to the the wider population, the, the community, because it would have been nice if um, more people had voted for it or had, had been aware of it. I'll feed that back to the Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group. Thank you. My Councillor Redfern. <clears throat> Could I ask what was the turnout for the, uh, the other Neighbourhood Plan, the Watton at Stone Plan? A lot higher. Mm -hmm. You haven't got a specific figure. No. Okay, that's not yes. That, okay. Any other questions or comments, uh, Councillor Crystal? Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think um, even though there was a low turnout, um, I think the chat. Most of the, the, I think pretty much all of the, the neighbourhood plans that have come forward so far, uh, and I could be I could be wrong, and I'm sure I'll be corrected, um, have been for uh, ward ward sized areas and obviously what is similar but um and so so a neighborhood plan for a, a relatively large area like where i think is always going to be a challenge and so i think that might reflect why a, a lower turnout was it was was produced um I, I think you know we the team behind the, the where neighborhood plan deserve all credit for what they did i think it's just very very much harder to get a town-wide uh, turnout on a specific event like that. It's, I think it's easier when you have a have a ward sized neighbourhood plan. Okay, uh, Councillor Dar, I think it's also affected by whether you're um, going to be voting alongside other elections because I know with Benjo we were voting alongside. I can't remember which election. There've been so many recently, but yes, we that makes a big difference. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Hart, I think you've already you've already made a contribution to this debate, but do you have a do you have a separate question? No, just to come back and say it's not a it it well, a lot of not, work went into it, indeed. so it'd be nice if it had a wider audience now. Actually. Okay, thank you. If that wasn't a separate separate question, then uh, remind members that that you should only speak once in the debate. Um, 
Okay, if there are no further further comments or questions, I will ask members whether uh, they are happy to accept the, res the, the recommendation, which is uh, to adopt the Ware Neighbourhood Plan 2021 to 2033. Our members, uh, could, could you by a show of hands, uh, all those members who are in favour? Okay, are there any against or abstentions? No, so thank you. That is also uh, carried unanimously and we move to item 9D, uh, land at Walken Road. Um, the land at Walken Road is an allocated site for 60 homes, site WAS3 in the Watton at Stone neighbourhood plan and is the first neighbourhood plan site that meets the requirement in the district plan to re prepare a master plan. The purpose of master plan framework documents is to bridge the gap between the policy allocating the site and the detail of a planning application by providing a collaborative approach to agreeing the high level design and, and layout principles for the site in the context of local constraint and opportunities. It establishes key parameters to guide developers and decision makers without being too prescriptive so that the detailed design can be shaped by the assessment and engagement with consultees at the planning application stage. The neighbourhood plan creates a strong vision for the site and building on the local engagement through the neighbourhood plan process, a Watton at Stone steering group was established to shape this master plan involving officers, Fairview Homes, councillors and the local community. Proposals have also, also been informed by feedback from the Hertfordshire Design Review Panel. The final landscape, the final master, master plan document sets out the framework for a sustainable, low carbon and landscape led development with a strong emphasis on enhancing active travel by improving walking and cycling connections to the village centre and surrounding countryside. This includes provision of a new bridge over the River Bean as part of a village circular walk identified in the neighbourhood plan, which has been agreed in principle by the Environment Agency. Open space is a key feature within the site and serves as a green buffer between the residential development and the river. The protection and enhancement of the River Bean is a key priority of the site and the master plan proposes biodiversity improvements on the land south of the river to improve the ecological value of the area. Therefore, the master plan framework document, as detailed in Appendix A to this report, provides a good basis to guide a future planning application and it is recommended that the document is agreed as a material consideration for the development management purposes. Thank you. Do you have a seconder for that recommendation? Uh, Councillor Thomas, thank you. Do you wish to speak? No, I don't. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there, uh, are there um, any other members who wish to comment or ask a question? Uh, Councillor Estor. Uh, just to um, welcome this uh, master plan, as all master plans are very helpful and um, proactive. Just one concern that um, is described as a collaborative master plan and the report says that the parish council was involved and there was a steering group involved and then the, the master plan document itself um, is headed with Fairview New Homes, which is the developer. I think it would, it would be very good if master plans like this had a section that said who was involved in the preparation, um, because this master plan doesn't have that at all, but a considerable weight attaches to a master plan when we understand who helped prepare it. And the fact that the developer was involved is a good thing, working with the community. Um, but I would, have, I would have been pleased to see that mentioned in the document itself. Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, Councillor Crystal. Uh, I'll be very quick. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, I, I, I chaired the master planning sessions and I was um, really impressed by the collaboration between the, uh, between the, the team from, from the Watnut Stone and the developer. Uh, it, was, it was very impressive and it, I think it provided a really good model. And I know Joe, will, I'm sure, will confirm, provides a really good model for how these things can work when they really work well. Um, so I was very impressed. Okay, thank you. 
So if there are no uh, further comments, um, I will pass the recommendation, which is to agree the land at Walken Road Master Plan Framework document for the Watnut Stone Neighbourhood Plan site application, known as WAS3, as a mirror, mirror material consideration for development management purposes. So by a show of hands, can I see all those who are in favour of accepting that recommendation? Thank you. Are there any against or abstentions? No, thank you. Well, that's a, 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 again, that is uh, unanimously carried. Uh, and I move on to um, item 10, the political balance and committee membership of the council update. And I will pass to the head of legal and democratic services. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just before I present the report, there is a slight error in uh, recommendation B on page 315. Um, where it refers to Appendix B, uh, that should in fact read Appendix A. Um, so just wanted to flag that to members before I present the uh, the body of the report. Um, so turning to the substance of that report, uh, in line with paragraph 3.3i and k of the Constitution, Council is required to approve its political balance and allocation of seats. The political balance of the Council has changed since this was last done in May of this year. Uh, and there, uh, as there have been some changes to the number of councillors within the Green Group. Uh, the new political balance can be seen at paragraph 2.3, along with the revised allocations of committee seats. Um, this report ensures that the council complies with the statutory obligations under the Local Government and Housing Act 1989 uh, and associated regulations. Uh, the recommendations are contained at page 315 of the agenda pack. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do I have a proposer for this recommendation? Councillor Goldspink. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I'm happy to propose this. And is that uh, seconded? Yes, I'm happy to second. I reserve my right. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Crystal. Okay, Councillor Deering. Thank you. Just if I could ask effectively a question for James mm -hmm. through you, if I may. Um, I apologise if this is a little bit nerdy, but it might be. Let's see. Um, I'm looking at the table on page 317 of the paper, uh, which I understand. Uh, but as I understand it, you have put the two ind new independent members into a group. And I'm just questioning whether, by definition, independents come together to form a group, or whether independents are independents. It's too sufficient. And it's too, just too amount to a group and is there a leader of this group or should there be two separate lines each with one member uh well councillor Deering, you'll be pleased to know that you're not the only nerd to ask a, a similar <laughs> question um uh, they are simply put together for for ease of reference that there are there are two independent members so they're not a group they're two independent members sitting independently um however they are still a member of the council as a whole um, of the 50 members, they are still elected members of East Tars District Council and are therefore um, eligible to have seats on committees. Um, there are councils throughout the country where there are many more independent members and clearly they are allowed to sit on on uh, committees as well. Um, so they are simply put in, into that table um, under independent for, for ease of reference that they are sitting as independents rather than having two separate lines with one and one independent. Uh, but they are not a group there are two independent members who um, are, are eligible for seats on committees um, merely through being a, an elected member of this authority. Can I have a follow-up to the answer? You may. Thank you so much. Uh, I obviously accept that everybody is a member and therefore proportionality applies to everybody. Um, but at risk of being even more nerdy, um, if we have two independent independent members does that mean that the percentage allocated to each of them should be two percent in which case would that make a difference in terms of uh, seats on committees i am enjoying the nerdy question so it's fine um i i, I think um, uh, on percentage points that there are two um that the so that they they are allocated a percentage of of the whole fifty, if you like. So, irrespective of the group that in which they sit, each member it, it obviously boils down to a percentage of the whole fifty. So that's how they've been worked out, um, and and that's how they've been allocated their seats. Um, 
as I said earlier, they are they are part of the of the wider fifty members of this of this authority, as opposed to the splits within to groups. So, by working them out, the the, the percentages would still be the same. Um, I, I would contend, but I, I'm I'm happy to um, further the, the nerdy discussions outside of this arena if if, if you would like okay. to do so. Okay, with a, with a, I, I will bring in Councillor Eric Buckmark. Okay, in... uh, only for information, really. When I first joined the council in 2010. I was one of five independents, and we did, in fact, form a group. So that is possible, but um, that's up to the individual mem members, whether they are truly independent or political. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Buckmaster. Uh, Councillor Nichols. Can I just point out for accuracy that the list of committee members isn't quite up to date? For example, I'm no longer a, um, a sub on the DMC. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that will be updated, I'm sure. Okay, any other questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Thomas. Yes, again, something on the same lines. Uh, I'm Joe Thomas, not a Joseph Thomas, so if that could be updated, I'd be greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. Anything? Well, I think we are sort of going down the, the nerdy route this evening, I'm afraid. Uh, any, any other comments? Well, if, if in... I will move on to the recommendations then. Uh, so recommendation A is that the revised political balance of the council at paragraph 2.3 be agreed, and B, that the member of scrutiny committees, regulatory, commi regulatory committees, and joint committees, um, as set out in appendix B, be agreed with those comments that have been made this evening, uh, with members being appointed in accordance with the wishes of the political group to, which, to whom the seats on these bodies have been allocated. So, members, by a show of hands, um, can I see uh, an indication? Did I say B? I, 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 I should be told off twice because it actually says Appendix A on my copy. So I do apologise. Um, sorry, Councillor Andrews. Could you, could you, could you put your, could you put your? I mean, I mean, it, it is Thank a fact you. of life. Do we need to agree them? Surely we note them. It, it is a fact. Okay. Well, uh, either way, we I think we should we should vote on the matter just just for. Uh, so, um, can I ask all those in favour? And any against? And any abstentions? No. Thank you. That is again um, passed unanimously. Or carried unanimously, I should say. Um, okay. So we then move on to item eleven: minor changes to the constitution. Um, and I again invite the Head of Legal and Democratic Services to present this report. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, at the executive meeting held on the 28th of November 2023, the executive agreed to the creation of an executive joint committee for the Harlow and Gilston Garden Town Project, uh, along with the other four partner authorities uh, to that project. Paragraph 2.6.3b of the Council's Constitution permits the monitoring officer to make changes to the Constitution so as to put into effect any decision of the Council, its committees, or, as in this case, the Executive. Paragraph 2.6.5 of the Constitution goes on to say that where any such minor changes to the Constitution are made, then the Monitoring Officer must notify members of those changes at the next meeting of the full Council, uh, that being this meeting. Details of those changes can be seen in Appendix A on pages 327 to 329 of the Agenda Pack, um, and uh, further, a change to the policy framework is being proposed as set out in paragraph 2.7 of the report. Uh, that is to remove the words, uh, quote, brackets and Harlow and Gilston Garden Town Project, close brackets, uh, from paragraph 3.2.1n. Uh, in accordance with paragraph 13.2.13 of the Constitution, any changes made to the policy framework are reserved to Council. Uh, the reference to a specific project in the policy framework is anomalous uh, and places East Hearts out of sync with the other partnership, partner authorities. Um, it should be stressed that its removal does not take away any plan, policy or planning application decisions relating to Hallow and Gilston Garden Town, um, which will be retained by East Hearts Council for those areas within our district. Uh, not amending the policy framework as set out in Recommendation B would mean that East Hearts' involvement in the Joint Committee would be hindered and would affect their ability to participate with it, uh, with it properly. 
Uh, the recommendations are set out at page 321 of the agenda pack. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I do have a proposer for this recommendation. Yes, I'm happy Councillor, to propose that. Councillor Crystal, thank you. Uh, and a seconder? Councillor Goldspinks. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> okay. Um, does any member wish to comment or ask a question? Uh, Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, merely um, as uh, having been involved with the review of the Constitution in the past, I appreciate that it's important both to keep the Constitution up to date and that it reflects the needs of the Council. So we're happy to support the, uh, the paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dunlop. Um, I, I'm not really in supporting this, and I'd just like to share my concerns regarding it. Um, my concern is that East Hearts District Council policy or strategy, should it be at odds with the strategy or the policy of the Harlow and Gilson Garden Town, then we've no option but to either vote for the policy or withdraw from the, the board itself. From the joint committee itself we've got no real option to veto the vote other than not attend and i wonder and question whether we would really do that um i've had multiple assurances from officers over the last week or so that papers would be prepared that would make sure there was no disagreement however it's not written in the inter-authority agreement and therefore it's not enforceable east hearts is providing 10,000 homes out of 23,000 almost half, and yet we only have one vote on the Committee of Five. Given the strategy includes, amongst other things, economic growth strategy, transport strategy, housing strategy, these decisions are important and they define why people live and work in East Hearts. The answer to this can be to include options in the agreement to veto or to withdraw the paper if not agreed. And I think that we should go back to the HGGT and negotiate terms, renegotiate those terms, I believe that we should not amend the constitution until we have renegotiated our position. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor Goldspring, you were, you were indicating at the, at the same time. So. Oh, yes. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I'm strongly in favour of this because I think the whole idea about it, it is that it will give this, um, this new group the ability to respond quickly and to make decisions quickly in the interests of, of the whole, whole group. Um, I hear what has just been said, um, but I think there is so much goodwill within the group that I think it most unlikely that um, East Hearts would feel that it needed to um, dissent from the opinions of the rest of the group. So I still support it. Thank okay. you. I will pass to the, the Head of Legal and Democratic Services to respond to, to Councillor Dunlop. So. I, I, think it, I think it's worth just clarifying that... Um, uh, Clearly, the, the points raised by Councillor Dunlop are with the mechanics of the Joint Committee itself. That's not what this paper is about. The, 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 the Joint Committee, as I referenced earlier on, was set up by the Executive on the 28th of November. This paper before Council tonight is simply to, um, with recommendation A, to note the, the change that, that I have made to, to the Constitution to put that into effect, and with B, um, the, the change to the policy framework in, in in the way that I outlined. So um, just, it's easy to get uh, uh, the, the two matters sort of conflated, um, but the paper that is before Council today is simply to, to note the changes to the Constitution, not the mechanics of the Joint Committee itself. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Councillor Eric Buckmaster. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and yes, taking into account what James Ellis has said, I totally understand that. Um, I also understand what John Dunlop is saying, although, as you've said, uh, the decisions have been made to form the joint committee across all of the partners. And I guess the context is that we need to be vigilant. Um, I share an area with John Dunlop. We're uh, allies in that sense in supporting our local community. And we need to ensure that as it progresses, it's done in the right way. And of course, uh, the effective veto would be you don't turn up for a meeting because if there's something being discussed, um, it has to be quorum. And the quorum, quorum is all five partners. So we just need to keep an eye. Um, the committees are supposed to be publicly available um, rather than the closed committees that they formerly were with the Garden Town. So I think let's reserve judgment and just keep on top and ensure that everything is done in the interests 
of our residents and this council as a whole. Thank you, Chairman. So, uh, Councillor Estop. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I fully support the setting up of a joint committee for strategy and policy reasons for the Garden Town area. But um, as the Head of Legal Services has just said, this you know, that isn't before us now, and neither is the inter-authority agreement, which will be defining how that committee works. What we have before us is a minor change to the constitution. And so in relation to that minor change, I've got three concerns. And one is that it's premature to change the constitution because the inter-authority agreement, which is extensive, is still in the process of being discussed and it's being tweaked by the five authorities. And it seems to make a lot of sense to me to get that complete and then to change the constitution. That seems to be in the interests of the council. The, the second concern is the, is the wording of the minor change. And, and in particular, the purpose, the purpose of the joint committee, it says is to coordinate and facilitate the delivery of 16,000 homes by 2033 and 7,000 homes in the years after, along with associated infrastructure. Well, frankly, that sounds like the developer's purpose. And, and I think that should be changed so that we have a purpose for the joint committee that is about coordinating the strategy for the garden town and facilitating infrastructure-led, community needs-led and landscape-led placemaking. And if that's not adequate, if that's not quite right, then I would suggest that anything in paragraphs 4.3 to 4.5 of the draft inter-authority agreement expresses the purpose better than what we have at the moment in this proposal. And the third concern is that it's very clear, you've, you've made it clear in the report, that Development Management Committee is not compromised at all, and, and Development Management Committee will continue to be the deciding body on planning applications. But, but we have a joint policy committee being set up, but we don't in this council have a policy, a planning policy committee. And we have a, we have a, a district plan review group but I, I just have a concern that we may have a joint policy um, and strategy committee for the five councils, but that's not quite balanced by our own committee structure. And so for those reasons, I, I feel that this is not in the interests of the council at the moment, and, and, and I would support it. Okay, thank you. Do you want, do you want to... Uh, no. At the risk of sounding like a stuck record, I, I will again obviously say that I, I, th I think what Councillor Estop was talking about there is, is very much the, the detail of the joint committee, which um, I, I would suggest would have probably been better handled at the 28th November meeting at the executive rather than this meeting, which is simply put notifying members of the changes that have been made to the constitution so that the, the 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 changes that i refer to a recommendation a have been made so this is me just notifying notifying the council of those changes so um not commenting on on, on the substance of what councillor Estop said but um other than to say they probably would have been better targeted to the exec meeting on the 28th of november rather than this one this evening thank you Okay, uh, Councillor Cox. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure James will say the same about my comment. Uh, my big concern is the amount, the area of the um, East Hearts District Council that we're giving over to this joint committee. It's a much bigger area than is actually being developed. And on the western side, we have the Brigham's House Estate, which has been allowed to go into ruin over 20 years. Um, if we give it up over to this development committee, who's going to look after it and restore it? Um, if that's going to be the um, responsibility of the development committee, fantastic. Um, but that doesn't appear to be the case. And there does appear to be a big risk um, that this, this area could be um, de um, developed in due course rather than um, preserved and restored. It's, um, 
it's an important point for the uh, people in that area that used to enjoy the Brigands estate. Mm. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as, as I, as I, I mean, uh, others may wish to comment, but as I understand it, the the um, committee will not be dealing with with planning issues, so that, that some of those issues will be covered. But again, it's it's a matter of the decision that goes back to the twenty eighth, I think, rather than rather than today. Um, I, I think, uh, Councillor Dumont. I suppose just a short comment that we've made it clear we're a listening council and a listening exec, and the place to come and provide the comment is before the meeting. Um, because some of the comments have been quite interesting. But now we haven't had the opportunity to think those or take those on board. So all members are welcome to come to the exec, and all members are able to see the exec papers before the, the meetings, and all members are able to pick up the phone to, to any of us as well if they've got comments or questions before the event would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, shall we move to the, the recommendations? Oh, Councillor Crystal, sorry. Sorry, can I just come back at, mm -hmm. the, at the end? I just wanted to, to thank... Uh, but thank the councillors for the comments. I, and I just very, very quickly try and address a couple of things. I think John, John, your comments are, are absolutely right, and I, and I think Eric, you're absolutely right there. We, you know, we have to be. You guys have to be absolutely spot on in watching what happens and being loud and, and vocal in things when, when things are occurring that you don't agree with or you're concerned by. I think that's critical. I think John, as we've spoken before, uh, the process for decision making in the joint committee is very much around agreement so officers working to get agreement first if they don't get agreement there then there's something wrong and they have to go back to the drawing board so that the, if it comes to the joint committee there is a kind of agreement between the partners and we and we have to tr we have to get a agreement between the partners that's critical otherwise we won't achieve anything and all of that pig money, all of that 171 million will go. And so, you know, that's what we must get. We must get the infrastructure. Um, Yvonne, I think, I think your second point that you made about, about strategy, I think that's the point of the Joint Committee. Um, it's about looking at the, the overall strategies. So I think, I think if you have a look at the, at the aims, I think you'll find for that particular point that that is addressed. Um, and I think, uh, lastly, Nick, the, the um, you know, it's a planning issue, as, as was said, but that part of land near Royden, that's been earmarked for, for a sustainable transport corridor. That's why, that's the kind of the primary purpose of that area. That's why it's there. Uh, so that's, I think, one of the focuses for, for that area of land. And I will, I'll, I'll say no more there. Thank you. Well, let us move to the recommendations. Um, so recommendation A, is to note the minor change to the constitution in appendix A, which is required to be made to be put into effect to sorry, to required to be made to put into effect the decision of the executive dated the twenty eighth of November twenty twenty three, which delegated authority to the head of legal and democratic services to make consequential amendments to the constitution to facilitate the establishment of the Harlow and Gilston Garden Town Joint Committee, and B to amend the policy framework at paragraph 3.2.1 N to set, uh, set out in paragraph 2.7 of this report. So uh, may I see uh, those who are in, do I, do I need to take, yeah, I do. Um, do, can I see by show of hands those who are in favour of that recommendation? Okay, and those against? Okay, and any abstentions? Thank you, uh, I believe that is carried. And we will move to item 12, car park fees, Bishop Stortford. And I, um, before I invite Councillor uh, Tim Hoskin to uh, present the report, I will note that there is a slight amendment to recommendation A in that there is a typo in the report. It should say climate change, not climate charge. OK, <laughs> so I will then invite uh, Councillor Hoskin. Yeah, I mean, that's a missed opportunity, really, because we could be making a profit, couldn't we? It'd be, it'd be good. Well, thank you, Chair, and, and good evening, everybody. Um, so this is specifically car parking fees in Bishop Stortford. Clearly, it plays out in a wider context of, of East Hearts, but this is specifically about car parking fees in Bishop Stortford. So just to be clear, the, 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 uh, the focus of this is on Bishop Stoford, but all parking charges, car parking charges across East Hearts will be increased in April 2024. 
And that, that will happen in line with the annual CPI increase of 6.7%, which was the one that was measured in September this year, it's just gone. And that follows the recommendation which was um, put forward to the executive in October 2022. So that's the, the sort of background. Pro um, car parking charges are going up in line with um, CPI. The council wishes to use the tools at, it, at its disposal um, to address the priorities of its climate change um, strategy and emerging air quality action plan, as well as to contribute to the goals of Hertfordshire County Council's local transport plan four. And one such tool available to the council um, is car parking tar tariffs, as it's argued that differential pricing um, can be used to encourage modal shift and a more effective use of um, existing car parks, which has the benefit of reducing unnecessary journeys, reducing that driving around hunting for car parking spaces and idling um, even within um, already full car parks, um, cars sat there idling. It's argued that by implementing an amended tariff structure, the council can reduce the number of unnecessary journeys between car parks and relieve the need for cars to circle around um, full car parks, as I say, hunting for a, a, a parking space. And in doing so, um, we're promoting long stay parking in Northgate, and which will free spaces up in other car parks for shoppers and visitors to the town. Given the financial pressures on the council, it's important to ensure that the proposed tariff amendments lead to no loss of income. So that's the backdrop that it's been almost back solved um, to fit the CPI uplift, which would happen if everything else happened in a straight line. So the modelling by the offices um, indicates that the revenue stream would be maintained. The impact of the proposed new tariff structure on behaviour will be kept under review. Um, it's important that we understand um, what effects this has. But it's perhaps best to view the effects of these proposed changes in the wider context of the installation of some other measures which we've taken um, in, um, in, in Bishop Stortford. First one, the variable messaging signs, which have just gone live prior to Christmas. Um, and those offer real-time information on parking space availability. It's entirely dependent on drivers taking that information and doing something with it, but the information is now being presented there. And there's four of those. Um, indicating the availability of the three main car parks throughout Bishop Stortford. There's been an installation of over 50, 54 in fact, um, e-vehicle chargers in Northgate End. So an attractive proposition, uh, hopefully a growing uh, attractive proposition for people to be able to park there. And there's also a paper going through, um, which at the moment we're sourcing additional um, charges, including rapid charges, um, again to be uh, installed throughout East Hearts. So this report proposes amended charges to car parks in Bishop Stortford um, as a first step to exploring the, uh, the, tariff, the impact of tariffs on behaviour. Um, and I propose this paper, sorry, the, the recommendations are on page 330, it spans across 330 and 331. If you'd like me to read them out, I can. No, that's okay. Thank you. So I, I propose this paper. Okay, thank you. And I believe Councillor Martin Adams is seconding the recommendation. Yeah, thank you. I second and reserve my right to speak later. Okay, thank you. So, do members have um, any comments or questions? Uh, Councillor Goldsping. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd like to support these proposed changes, uh, which are coming in um, as a trial in Bishop Stortford. Um, the changes are proposed partly in response to the business community's request for concessionary parking for 100 spaces in the Northgate End car park, and partly in an attempt to encourage more people to use the Northgate End car park. Another reason is that if more cars, or more drivers parked in the Northgate End car park for long stay parking, that would free up some of the short-stay car parking in the other car parks near to the town centre. And that would encourage more people to patronise the shops and businesses in the town. What is proposed in this paper would deliver more than 400 reduced charge long-stay spaces instead of the 100 which the BID, the business um, 
district uh, members originally requested. So if long-stay parkers used the spaces, that would free up more short-stay spaces in Apton Road and Basbo Lane. The council is required to balance its books. And very many complicated calculations have been done in the preparation of this paper um, in order to balance the loss which the council would incur from the reduced charges with the increases which have had to be made elsewhere. As a new administration, we inherited the responsibility for running the Northgate End car park. This is not, it's, it's sadly, it is not a user-friendly car park and many people are scared and frightened of using it. And the council, frankly, is losing money on it. I would like this council to take urgent action to vastly improve the stairwells, the lighting, and the disabled access, and the general security of the car park. And I hope that these improvements can be made as quickly as possible and before these proposed changes come in in April. I do support the changes and I will be voting in favour of it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wiley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've read this, this report, and um, like the curate's egg, there are good parts and there is bad parts to it. Um, I said I fully supported the previous, um, the non-key decision, and I was genuine when I said I'd like to thank Councillor Hoskins because I thought it did tick the box. Unfortunately, this one ticks boxes, squiggles boxes, and tears the paper up. So I'm afraid I won't be supporting it. I do like the new pricing for Northgate End. I would support that. Um, I don't have a problem with the CPI increase. I do have a problem when we're putting Apton Road up by 25% at some points, Basbo Lane 25%, and Elm Road up by 54%. So with those increases, I just could not support this this document. But I also have some concerns about Northgate for retail workers, many of whom start before what, seven o'clock in the morning. Northgate End doesn't actually open until seven, I believe. So it's not actually going to benefit anybody who starts at say five o'clock to bake things or do whatever they want to do at five o'clock in the morning in Bishop Stortford. So um, that is another another issue. But yeah, as I say, if it was if we if we took the proposals for the, the the CPI increase, I'd be happy with that. If we took the proposals for Northgate end pricing, I'd be happy with that. But I'm afraid the other price increases I just cannot accept. So I will be voting against this. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jacobs. Thank you. Um, two months ago, when we discussed the bids proposal for discounts for town centre workers, we were told that. It wasn't an acceptable proposal for two main reasons. The first reason we were given that was that a bespoke solution for Bishop Stortford wasn't appropriate. In words he may be coming to regret, the leader said that a holistic solution was required across the whole district. And Councillor Glover Ward, in the minutes that we earlier this evening approved, said that the proposed review of the decision would be district-wide and not just concentrated in Bishop Stortford. So I'm struggling to understand why that was right two months ago, but is wrong now, and that we now need a bespoke solution for Bishop Stortford's parking. And a bespoke solution that only addresses four of the eight council-managed car parks in Stortford as well. The logic of that also escapes me. Um, the second reason that was, we were given for rejection was that discounted parking was likely to encourage more car journeys increase air pollution, et cetera, was uh, against the council's climate change policies. Well, two months on again, all of that is forgotten. And instead of saying that discounted parking is wrong, we're now offering over 570 discounted parking spaces in Northgate End. I was astonished to hear the deputy leader say that, parking in, uh, that, that people find parking in Northgate End scary and frightening but we then want more of them to park there. Now, I understand she said that we need to make adjustments to the, to the design and layout of the car park. Without those changes, it is entirely wrong for us to be encouraging more people to park there. 
Now, this council claims to be a listening council. I can't see any evidence of that in this proposal, quite the opposite. The, the Stortford bid is a non-political organisation representing all of the businesses in the town centre, and the bid has been unequivocal in its rejection of this proposal. Uh, its statement describes it. Well, I'm going to read the first paragraph of its statement. They say, it is our view this will not solve the current parking problems in our town centre, as well as it not being the previously promised holistic view. We believe it will adversely affect trading conditions, making it even tougher for businesses and further crippling them in an already challenging time. They go on to say, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but they go on to say it's a draconian proposal and that it's short-sighted. Now, if we are genuinely a listening council, we have to listen to those claims. This proposal says that uh, on page 336 that uh, these changes will increase the income from parking in Stortford around £170,000. That £170,000 is coming out of the pockets of town centre workers, residents who, who use some of these park, uh, car parks as well, businesses, etc. Now, those residents are facing a cost of living crisis. They're facing increases in their council tax. They're in, they're facing inflation at what was over 10%. And we're now telling them that their car parking has to go up by 25 to 54%. Surely that can't be right. So, Council, for those reasons, I'm opposed to this proposal and I would like to ask for a recorded vote when we come to it, please. You will need five members for that recorded then. I'm hoping okay. you'll, you'll ask people to support that proposal. Well, I will, I, I will ask people to stand at the, at the appropriate time. Okay. Uh, are there are other are there other members who wish to speak, Councillor Deering? Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I think we would substantially align ourselves with the, the comments just passed. Um, uh, parking has to be grappled with, um, but broadly speaking, we, we don't think these proposals represent uh, a sensible package. I'd certainly like to uh, endorse the comments that we can't see that there's been anything like the sort of consultation or listening. Uh, that yeah, you yeah. make so much fuss about on your side of the room. Um, so uh, John obviously will vote against uh, your, your proposal, Tim, but the rest of us will abstain. Uh, and we you know, will give you a chance to go away and think about it and come back again. At some point, we need to get this right. Uh, but um, one of the inherent difficulties with what you're proposing, and I think it was used, used the word, I think, uh, differential. By definition, if you have differential pricing, some people are benefiting, some people aren't. Um, um, so you, we, we, we are, in the nicest way, going to send this back to you for further, well, uh, subject to how the vote goes, send it back to you for further consideration. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Councillor Eric Park Buckmore. Yeah, just to endorse uh, what Councillor Deering has said, I was going to say some very similar things. Um, and as John Wiley has said, there are good parts of it and there are bits that are not good. Um, it does seem to be all over the place. Now, I do accept that the overall price increase for those car parks involved is within the CPI. Uh, but as the earlier speakers were saying, and uh, Councillor Deering has said, uh, this needs more work. So I, I will not be voting against it, but I will be abstaining. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Councillor Estop. Um... Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um... This, this um, recommendation seems to have three objectives. objectives. One, is, um, one is to get modal shift and address climate change and air quality. The second one is to redistribute long-stay and short-stay parking. And the third is to um, prepare for increased charges. And I think out of those three, only the third one succeeds by this proposal. Um, I think it's disingenuous to, to connect differential parking charges with modal shift because modal shift will only come with medium term measures such as the the northern cycle route proper use of sexton's road um, improvements to bus services and improvements to footways and lighting these are the kinds of things that will will gradually make that shift and in terms of the long stay the short stay that's that's we do th this is addressing a very specific problem about parking and traffic in Stortford and the the redistribution of, of long stay parking is right but the messages that come out of this are blurred because all the charges are going up 
it um it just seems a bit it, it it's it's it doesn't seem as if that's going to work i i will i look forward to what we've heard about proposals to northgate end to improve it um taking place and then that being combined with with a communications strategy to help people change their normal routine and to and to get that shift in parking to solve the problem of parking in Stortford in the short term. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Britton. Thank you. Um, just to kind of talk a little bit about the timescales, um, we obviously had the CPI increase coming in in, in April anyway. Um, so the, the idea behind trying to get this done quickly was so that the changes to the kind of like the, the differential pricing could come in at the same time, which obviously makes for much easier implementation. We also felt that after after the last proposal, there was a, a kind of a demand to um, do something about parking at Bishop Stortford. So we did listen to that and we and we, we did what we could in a short space of time and, and we put the officers under a lot of pressure. And I'd just like to thank all the officers for working under that pressure to meet a very, very tight deadline. And it did involve kind of having to do a lot of work. Um, as, far, as far as the, obviously you got the gist of the, of the proposal, we, we don't know whether it will drive consumer change. Um, it's very uncertain, but we kind of felt that the status quo wasn't working. Um, so we need to do something. We also didn't feel that the bid proposal was was right because that was offering kind of parking to a selected 100 people, and we felt we wanted a proposal that was fairer, that was something that was available to everybody in Bishop Stortford rather than just a selected 100 people. Um, with the CPI increase that's due in April, the price of Northgate End would have gone up to five pound fifty-five. So by keeping it at four pound twenty or reducing it to four pound twenty, that's going to make a one pound thirty-five difference for everybody that parks in Northgate End, which is actually not very, not far short of what the bid were after at £1.70. But we're making that available to everybody, which is obviously a much better scenario than just having this group of people. We don't, we want, don't want it to be something that's a privileged thing to have, to have a special parking space at a discount. So I think fairness is really important. Um, and I, th I think that was basically, basically what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If I can pass to Councillor Swainston. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am going to su support this motion. Bid are very well aware that I'm going to do that, so recorded vote or not, they know my position. I think this is worth trying. I'm really pleased that those extra 400 people are going to get the chance to park more cheaply, and the people who are likely to do that are more likely to be workers. In addition, I was at some of the meetings between BID and Councillor Hoskin and Councillor Gover Ward. Some of the things they were asking for were ways of freeing up short-term parking in the town centre. And I believe, we don't know yet, but you know, we hope this is going to work. They want more footfall by allowing more sh um, shoppers to park in somewhere like Jackson Square and reduce the number of workers that are parking there for the whole days. So this is a way of trying that and encouraging those people to try other car parks that are a little bit cheaper. If you've got very heavy shopping or anything like that, then I appreciate, you, you know, Jackson Square, right by Sainsbury's, et cetera, is important. If you're just work, walking to your place of work, I mean, it's maximum extra five minutes walk from Northgate End to places in the town centre. So it's not a big deal in that sense. And I think it's worth giving this a trial. Nothing's irreversible, but if we don't try, we'll never know. Uh, Councillor Dahl. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to pick up a few members opposite mentioned, reference the listening council and public consultations. Well, at the last full council, the members opposite the Conservatives put forward this um, request to go with the bids proposal, and that would have just involved 100 town centre workers, and you were proposing that without any public consultation. And what we're proposing is an offer that will will be open to all people in Bishop Stortford, and it is a trial. So, so this is 
this is this I, I dis, dispute with you about your point about public consultation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Hopewell. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just um, to pick up on the comments and concerns by the bid. I'm sorry, I didn't write down the exact wording that you said, but I understand there were concerns about it adversely affecting trading conditions and making it even tougher for businesses. Um, I know there have been occasions in other towns and cities where there's been adjustments to parking. And yes, initially, there have been concerns about the impact on trading. But you know, after it's been trialed for a certain period of time, those fears haven't come to pass in the end. So I think it is important to to at least see, like other people have said, you know, see if, if these concerns are valid or, or if actually it will turn out to, I mean, I know um, in, in other areas, it's imp having kind of a different parking structures ended up improving things for, for businesses and trades, despite there being concerns to the contrary before it started. Um, and as it is a trial, the opportunity remains to make adjustments, you know, but we'll then at least have some evidence and data and, and, and we'll have something to work on that isn't just speculation and concerns which may not come to pass. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Copley. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, obviously, I can see there's a lot of emotion about this tonight. Understandably, I think we're all trying to work in the best interests of the people of Bishop Stortford and obviously East Hearts as a whole. Um, and I think everybody is sat here trying to do the right thing, whether we agree or disagree. Um, but I just wanted to focus away from the emotion for a second and just try and pull out some of the key facts we've heard. And hopefully also anybody, you know, watching this at home, you can obviously look at the key facts yourself. Obviously, um, Councillor Hoskin has referred to his report, which is attached to the agenda so people can read it themselves and maybe come to their own conclusion rather than you know, following maybe what people have said on social media, and I'd say that generally, please try and look at the underlying facts. And some of the important ones that I think we should take into account is obviously all the car parking charges across East Harts are going to be going up by, you know, 6.7% in April, and that includes Stortford, Hartford, Ware, Sorbridge, etc. Um, that increase was obviously voted for by the previous council administration last year. So we're deciding between... Um, you know, this proposal or a flat increase, we're not deciding whether there'll be no increase at all or some other scheme. So we need to bear that in mind. Um, also, obviously, there's three of the smaller car parks in Bishop Stortford will have their rates increased by more than this. But then we've got the largest car park in Bishop Stortford Northgate End, which will have its rates reduced. So that's got hundreds of spaces. Um, the same car park that would have had obviously the discounted spaces under previous proposal as well so averaging that out obviously the rate increase in Stortford is still going to be that 6.7 percent like the rest of its parts however it does mean there's going to be some higher cost spaces and there will be some cheaper spaces as well um, so some of those higher cost spaces will go up by a slightly bigger percentage than the cheaper spaces go down because there are going to be more spaces at the cheaper rate um, Jackson Square will increase by the same rate as the rest of East Hearts. Just so, because I know a lot of people like parking in Jackson Square. <laughs> I just thought it was as well keeping that in mind. Um, if the current proposal is passed, I think people have also picked up that if that, those differential rates don't work, that can be changed. So we're not locked into something for life. Um, and as I said earlier, if the councils vote against the proposal today, the rates of the other car parts will still go up. Um, this isn't a permit scheme. We've all picked up on that. Um, so it's not going to be allocated partic for particular individuals. That means someone is, who isn't going in every day, um, their, their discount isn't wasted. Someone else could use that discounted space. There's no administrative costs either associated with it. However, whether you think that's positive or negative about not having, um, having that, there's no selection criteria, um, you know, whoever you are will get a discount, but obviously we wouldn't be able to do that discount to more people in need, but there was never 100% that that was going to be in any previous schemes anyway. So whoever you are, you get this discount. Um, and also under this scheme, no one is tied to park in a particular car park. You do still have freedom of choice, whereas permit, you would obviously have to use that there. Um, I mean, those are the facts that I think we should make our decision on. I'm sure some people have some other facts they'd like to throw into the mix, but I do think we need to try and 
move away from the emotion if we can and focus on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Townsend. Thank you, Chairman. And it's good to hear so many varied views. Um, I speak to a very large number of people on a day-to-day -day basis, and a lot of them have voiced opinions and concerns over safety and access, particularly those perhaps more uh, less able or disabled or more elderly. And therefore, although they would be attracted by a reduced cost, they also are dissuaded by the distance to their normal um, places of either work or entertainment. That The other car park is that far away. Now, on a personal viewpoint, I'm quite happy to confess I never liked that new car park. I felt it was rather grotesque. However, we have it, and we have to try and maximise its use. In addition, we need to try and get people to... Um, utilise it more frequently, which will in turn help to dispel some of the safety and um, uh, the safety fears they have of going into what's currently a very disused car park. It's a very underused car park. So when there are more people in and out, when the suggested changes perhaps are put in place, they will feel more comfortable, they will feel less fearful of going into a large empty space with lights that come on and off when they're not necessarily expecting them. And as time moves on, they will possibly change their habits and migrate to use that facility. Meanwhile, the emphasis that I've been given is very much one of endeavouring to try and support the idea of reducing some charges of those that suggested we really need to get this used on a wider scale and to try and look at the benefits and the practicalities of both modal shift and getting the traffic flowing, but not flowing in the wrong places. So we have a problem there, obviously, with restricted access in and out of that particular car park. We can only suck it and see, effectively. So thank you for everybody's contributions, because we can only keep on trying to listen continually without political bias and say, what can we do next? What can we do best? How can we make this work? for everybody's benefit. Thank you. Are there any further contributions? Uh, Councillor Gover Ward. Um, as has been mentioned, I've sat in uh, a couple of meetings with the Bishop Stortford um, uh, bid organisation and their targets were very, very clear. They wanted cheaper parking for town centre workers for all day and they wanted Apton Road and Basbo Lane freed up from having people parking in there all day, present, preventing shoppers from them parking in there. And they saw that as a major problem. The car parking charges for anything under up to five hours in Apton Road and Basbo Lane for the shoppers have not gone up by a significant amount different to the CPI. It's either been slightly less or slightly more dependent on which one you look at. The only charge that has gone up significantly is that for the 12 and a half hours of parking, and that is specifically designed to discourage the long-term parking, the all-day parking in there, which is exactly what the Bishop Stortford um, bid asked us for. Um, one of the things I would say, and I'm sure that uh, the member for environmental uh, sustainability will uh, chip in on this um, afterwards, is that there is a district-wide review going on um, and all parking in the whole of East Hearts is being looked at. Um, the Bishop Stortford proposals are by way of a trial. It says that in the paper they will be monitored, as has been said, if after six months they are not working as they should or if there is something that's completely outrageous on them, I'm sure they can be adjusted. Um, but they will be that trial will then be used to inform what might then be rolled out ac across the district, the good and the bad. Um, the other thing I would um, like to say as well is the bid has made significant points about the reason that that people perceive uh, Northgate End as being frightening and dangerous and a bit dodgy is because there's nobody parked in there. 
So if we resolve the issue that there is only 20 to 50 pet spaces of the 400 odd being parked in by having more people parking in there all day, that then hopefully resolves one of the issues. I do know that there is a shopping list of improvements for Northgate End. Um, I don't know where we have got to at impl implementing those, but I know that there is budget set aside for them. Um, but I'm not close to the, the detail on that. So there will be improvements. Um, and the final thing I'd like to say is one of the things I've, I've noticed over the last few council meetings is the people opposite have mostly been mentioning balanced budget quite a lot. <laughs> um, if we are going to provide some discounts on differential parking, we've got to make it up somewhere. And we have targeted the, um, the, the, ta the, 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 the amounts to make it up in the way that targets the thing that people don't want, which is the all day parking in Apton Road and Basbow Lane, preventing shoppers, preventing the footfall, preventing the people popping in for two hours for a, a quick lunch with somebody or popping in to do their shopping. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further contributions before we go to the vote, I will ask uh, Councillor Hoskin for a right of reply. Okay, well, thanks. Um, just to reiterate, I think Sarah's comments, thanks for all the comments. Um, actually, it was Richard that said that. Thanks for all the comments. It's very, um, very heartening that this uh, car park can be so interesting. It's uh, quite, quite... Differential pricing is a crude instrument. I mean, there's no doubt. It, it's not um, cause and effect. It's going to influence, but it's not going to be pull this lever and watch exactly what happens. We can't predict that. So we are um, able to... to, to to watch and monitor and see what effect it has. It has to be part of a longer scheme about how we resolve parking, not just in Bishop Stoke, and not just in East Arts, but across you know, our reliance um, on having to drive and park everywhere, whilst it's essential in some instances, may not be essential in all instances. So that's something we need to be thinking through. There was a question mentioned about um, a holistic approach, and certainly that's our intention. When we started looking at this, we were driven by the bid in terms of it being a necessity, a need, a, a, a requirement within Bishop Stover, and that centred our, our, our thinking and our, and our listening. A more holistic approach will require consultation because it will involve some traffic regulation um, orders which will need to be done. And if we look at some of the anomalies across car parking across East Hearts, you'd have to say some of those are worth consulting on. Equally so, the opening times, John, for um, the, the car park are worth consulting on to see you know, if we can make that more, more attractive and more useful. I think um, I'd take exception to a comment which says all charges are going up. Um, because clearly they're not, um, you know, charges are going down and, and um, some of those have been, have been drawn out within the debate and they're certainly there for everybody to see both at home and within this room on the report. It, it's, it's an interesting comment about comms um, that David brought up in terms of how we get people on board. And I think that is important. And we've got to April, if this vote gets through, um, then we've got until April. Well, let, let's say we've got until April to explain the CPI increase. But we've also got until April, if these differential um, charges come in, to be able to describe how that works, how that the intentions are, and what people can do in order to be able to operate um, and use that those successfully. I think it's 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 worth reflecting on um, that there is a lot of comment about Northgate End, some of which is at the sort of somebody told me they didn't like it, so I don't like it either, sort of bracket. But I think there's quite a lot of factual stuff in there. Um, and I understand the point about heavy doors. I understand the point about um, a, a, an appearance which isn't attractive. And I think there are things we can do with that. I understand the point about lights just coming on for the spot where you are and not the whole floor, which would be useful. And I understand the point about the stairwells uh, and the lighting within the stairwells. Those look fixable and they look, um, they say, well, I think they should happen regardless. I think that's just something that we should be doing. Um, the fact that it looks like a garrison is perhaps, um, is perhaps something else that we could tackle as well. Um, my last point is that, and I'll just um, thank um, Sarah Copley and, and Vicky Glover Ward for making the points about the facts. This is a factually based 
um, report. The, the facts have been laid out within the report and they've been um, happily repeated within, within the discussion that we've had. So um, my recommendation to the council is that we, having absorbed those facts and absorbed the debate that's gone on and the responses that have been made, um, that we back the recommendations within the paper. And I again propose that. Okay, thank you. Um, I will read out the, the uh, well, there has been a request for um, a recorded vote. So are there five members who are in favour of a recorded vote? Okay. Could, could you show again, please? Hands up, yeah. I think, yeah, I think we have. Okay, that's fine. So I will read out the recommendations and then we will have a recorded vote. So the recommendations to Council, A, to work towards climate change and air quality aspirations by amending car parking tariffs in Bishop Stortford to influence parking behaviour by implementing the amended charges as set out in Appendix A, which also incorporates inflation update, uplifts, and B, to authorise the Head of Legal and Democratic Services to publish a notice of variation under the Road Traffic Regulation Act to give effect to the introduction of the new tariff structure. Okay. Okay. I'll just read your name out one at a time if you could let me know if you're voting for, against, or abstain. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Andrews. Councillor Boylan. Councillor Britton. For. Councillor Buckmaster. Sorry, yes, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Ruth Buckmaster. Councillor Burt. Four. Councillor Butcher. Councillor Carter. Four. Councillor Clements. Against. Councillor Connolly. Four. Councillor Copley. Four. Councillor Cox. Four. Councillor Crystal. Four. Councillor Dar. Four. Councillor Deering. Abstain. Councillor Deffley. Abstain. Councillor Devonshire. Abstain. Councillor Demont. Four. Councillor Dunlop. Four. Councillor Estop. Against. Councillor Glover Ward. Four. Councillor Goldspink. Four. Councillor Hart. Four. Councillor Hill. Four. Councillor Holt. Abstain. Councillor Hopewell. Four. Councillor Horner. Abstain. Councillor Hoskin. Four. Councillor Jacobs. Councillor Marlow. Councillor McAndrew. Oh, Councillor Nichols. Four. Councillor Redfern. Abstain. <coughs> Councillor Stowe. Abstain. Councillor Swainston. Four. Councillor Thomas. Four. Councillor Townsend. Councillor Watson. Four. Councillor Wilcock. Against. Councillor Williams. Four. Councillor Williamson. Abstain. Sorry, it's all just frozen on me. Uh, and Councillor Wiley. Against. So that's 25 for, 5 against, and 12 abstentions. Okay, so that is uh, carried. And we move to item 12A, the Council Tax Base Supplementary Agenda number 2, pages 2 to 8. Um, this item wasn't on the original agenda. Uh, and under Section 100B4B of the Local Government Act 1972, I have agreed to add this item to the agenda as a matter of urgency. And I invite Councillor Carl Britton, Executive Member for Financial St Sustainability, to present the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, members have before them the tax base report at item 12A. The tax base for the whole district is 64,809 .9 which is an increase of 917.1 on 2023-24. The calculation is performed 48 times, one for each parish, 
and these are aggregated to produce the tax base for the whole district. The calculation follows the calculation set out in regulations. Chairman, I move that the Council approve the calculation of the Council's tax base for the whole district and for the parish areas for 2024-25 as set out in the report for item 12A. Okay, thank you. And do you have a seconder? Councillor Crystal, thank you. Um, okay, are there any members who wish to comment or to ask a question on this item? Councillor Boylan. I don't have any objection with regards to the content of the paper, but um, I just wonder what the legal status of the paper is, seeing as the date of the meeting is not for another year. Um, it says the 13th of December 2024, um, and at the end of the summary, um, it's giving the wrong um, tax year. Um, it, it's it's um, to recommend to council the calculation of the council tax base for the whole district and for each parish and town council for 23-24, which we're already in. And mm -hmm. B recommend the recommendation B, right at the end, talks about the year 24-24. Do we have any comments on that? Yes, there, there, there are clearly some errors errors there. Can we can we obviously to the twenty four twenty four should be twenty four twenty five and mm. the date of the meeting is clearly thirteenth of December twenty twenty three. Okay. Can we propose an amendment? So can you propose an amendment for that, yes please, for those to, to, to reconcile those those changes. So, so it's the date of the meeting is twenty is 2023 not 2024 yeah uh, in in the recommendation item b um this penultimate line it should say below for 24 2024 straight 25 and did you say there was another yes on page two immediately before where it says recommendations for council it's got the current year instead of next year Yes, yes, right down in, in the summary. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the summary on page two, it should say um, 20, yeah. 24, 25. Yeah, I think I think the, the amendment needs to just cover what's within the recommendation. So it's that 20, 24, 24 needs to be 24, 25 at the end. So you're proposing that that um, that amendment and that seconded as well. But Chair, the, the, this is a published document that is in the public domain. I think it's quite right that we should be amending the, 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 the mistakes. Otherwise, people further down the line will be looking at this and it will be totally inaccurate and incomprehensible. Okay, thank you. I will ensure that that's, that's uh, corrected in the minutes and that point is made. Are there any other comments? Uh, uh, Councillor Prasad. Uh, Councillor Holt. Um, Sorry. No problem. Um, re regarding um, on page two, am I correct that table one is to include uh, a list of all parishes? T sorry, ta table one. Uh, table one, yes, yes, which is in page two. Yes. Um, the uh, Bengio uh, Rural, um, the parish of Bengio Rural, uh, seems to be excluded. Um, I think, again, I would see clarification, but I believe that is... That is Bengio, is Bengio Rural? No, that they're two separate parishes. Oh, two separate it's the parishes parish of, of Bengio and the parish of Bengio Rural. Okay, well, perhaps the legal, legal services can... Uh, uh, well, I, I have uh, taken advice from my learned colleague, and apparently a Bengio Rural hasn't set a precept, hasn't set a precept, which is why it wouldn't be included in the table. Great, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. F further comments or clarifications? Okay, so as as amended, uh, may I move the the recommendations for council? Um, A uh, to approve the calculation of the council. Sorry, sorry. Yes, that's may, may I have just a point of order. Then um, I'd have thought whether or not a parish sets a precept, um, it's still in the council tax base for the whole of the district. So I'd have thought that information needs to be in there. If they choose not to pre, they may set a precept. We don't know, um, but whether they do or not, the information on the council tax base presumably needs to be there. Um, 
Councillor, this report has followed the format of the report, which has been um, approved by Council for the past four years at least. Um, it's not been the convention not to include in the parish areas those parishes that don't set a precept, but their, their council tax base is taken into account in the council tax base as the district as a whole. This is usually dealt with by the Head of Revenues and Benefits. Unfortunately, the Head of Revenues and Benefits is retired, and this was done very quickly by me. I did not have a chance to go through each and even individual detail. I followed the pre I followed the report that has been approved by Council for the at least the last four years, and not including those particular parishes. I take on board this feedback, and I will include in future years those parish those parish areas that don't set a precept. Thank you. Okay, so so with that with that further clarification, I, I will move to the recommendations. Uh, recommendation A, to approve the calculation of the council tax base for the whole district and for the parish areas for 2024-25. And recommendation B, to note that pursuant to the report and in accordance with the local authorities' calculations of tax base regulations 2012, the amount calculated by East Hertfordshire District Council as its council tax base for the whole area for 2024-25 shall be £64,809.90 and for the parish areas listed below for 2024-25 shall be as follows. Do members wish me to, to, to go through each each parish? No, thank you. I will take that as read and I will ask for, with, with a show of hands for those who are in favour. And for those against and any abstentions. So that's, that's unanimous. Carried, thank you very much. And we move to the motions on notice, of which there have been two uh, uh, motions. And I move to Councillor Swainson, who I, um, I believe is going to propose the first. Thank you, Chair. So um, the mo motion on proportional representation, I'll just um, go through the background. So in Europe, only the UK and Belarus still use the archaic single round first past the post for general elections. England also uses it for local elections. Internationally, proportional representation, PR, is used to elect the parliaments of more than 80 countries. These countries tend to be more representative, more inclusive and greener. PR ensures all votes count, have equal value and that seats won, match votes cast. Under PR, MPs and parliaments better reflect the age, gender and characteristics of both local communities and of the nation. PR would also end minority rule. In 2019, 43.6% of the vote produced a UK government with 56.2% of the seats and 100% of the power. In 2005, Labour was elected with 35.2% of the votes cast, yet received a majority of the seats. PR would have prevented wrong winner elections, such as occurred in 1951 and February 1974. Locally, on East Hearts District Council, the Conservatives won all 50 seats in 2015, with only just half the votes cast. In 2019, they won 80% of the seats with 46% of the vote. In 2023, the Greens won more seats on East Arts District Council, with 5% less of the vote than the Conservatives. PR is already used to elect parliaments and assemblies of Scotland, <coughs> Wales and Northern Ireland. It is also used for local elections in Scotland and Northern Ireland and is being introduced in Wales. Its use should now be extended to include Westminster and the local elections in England. Therefore, I would like this council to vote for the motion. This council therefore resolves to write to HM government calling for a change in our outdated electoral laws and to enable proportional representation to be used for UK general elections and local elections in England. Thank you. Do you have a seconder for the motion? 
Councillor Marlow, do you wish to speak or reserve your right? Okay, thank you. So, um, contributions. Uh, Councillor Eric Boatmaster. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a very political motion, so I'm going to give a political response. But I just want to know, it's not personal. I admire all of you, um, but I'm going to be... So please don't be offended. But I have to say, this is often raised by Liberal Democrats who fail to make a breakthrough in national politics. There are many countries with PR, but not all are good examples of decision-making um, and democracy in action. But good or bad, in many of them, it enables the presence of more extreme right or extreme left populist parties and the need for more complex coalitions that can often break down with parties that receive the most votes left in opposition and out of decision-making. In 2015, uh, in that general election, PR would have meant over 50 UKIP MPs. I know, we wouldn't want that, would we? Just by accident, the makeup of political groups here currently is not a million miles from the proportion of votes cast across the district. However, I don't recall being invited by the two parties opposite in the interests of fairness and proportionality to join a coalition of parties that represents all residents or to share a place on the Old River Lane Board. So what we have is a minority party with 30% of their members on the executive. And that's fine. That's your right to do so. And we're happy in opposition. However, exactly the same could happen with proportional representation, with a number of minority parties forming the administration. And finally, even though we organise ourselves into political groups, electors in practice place their votes against individuals, as opposed to lists, as is the case in Germany and France. And that was very evident in this year's local elections where many candidates received more than the bloc party vote. So they were voting for individuals as well as parties. So ours is also a system which, although very rarely, enables independence to break through, as I did originally here, as mentioned earlier. So for all those reasons, I think we've had a system that's evolved over many years and works. And actually, I think we're a lot better than some of those European countries where democracy can break down and you have shorter administrations. So I oppose the motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Clements. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I support a lot of what's in this motion. Um, it wasn't entirely clear to me exactly what we are calling for here because there's, there's a number of different systems that would come under a proportional representation umbrella, you know, party list, single transferable vote, mixed member. It's not clear to me from this if we are calling for a specific one of those, if we are calling for the general idea, if it's the general idea, are we calling for the government to do some sort of consultation to work out which system we actually want? So I, I don't know if you had sort of something in mind, particularly with, with this, or if it is just the, the general proportional representation. And if so there, then I'm, I'm, I'm interested to kind of see what, what you are hoping for from the government in terms of like how they go about making that decision. Um, so that was my kind of question there. Okay. Any, uh, Councillor Devonshire. Yeah, I'd like a clarification from the Head of Legal Services, please, that are we allowed, to, as a motion, we're supposed to be, I think all motions have to relate to this district. How does this relate to this district? It doesn't seem to. It seems to be a national um, thing that we're talking about here. And I'm, I'm not sure that our uh, constitution allows that. Great minds think alike when I first saw the motion. Um, however, the, 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 there is um, quite a bit of um, focusing in on this council, and um, I think there's reference there to, a moment, um, to, to, to the amount of votes cast in the local elections in East Hearts and the, and the members sitting within this council. So um, in, a, in a, um, a broad position of trying to allow as many motions as, as possible, um, whilst there is a, a definitely um, a, a national aspect to this, I think the fact that it did focus in on East Hearts as well, um, I, I, I allowed it. Councillor Goldsbink. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, I can answer that question um, because, as, as people know, I'm a Liberal Democrat and I have been very, very frustrated over many, many years 
because I know when I vote in a general election, my vote will not count. Um, this is a so solid Tory constituency, and ho however I vote, however much I canvass, um, my vote will not count. Um, and that is very disappointing. And many people feel the same as I do. And so we might end up thinking, well, why would we bother? Whoever stands here for the Conservatives will be elected. And it doesn't matter how good our candidates are or other parties' candidates are, we will not be elected. So I really strongly support um, this uh, motion tonight. I do think proportional representation would be much better and in that uh, system, whichever one you choose, and I understand there are many different variations, um, they would make sure that every vote counted. So I strongly support this motion. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, being, being mindful of the hour and that we would have to vote um, shortly to, to extend beyond 10 o'clock if we, if we continue. But I, I will take Councillor Marlowe first because you, you were indicating and then I have several other indications. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say this. Um, I think that this is to start a general conversation around PR. We really do need to get on and get it into this country because the adversarial position that is taken here puts so many people off between the two big parties. They don't see that they're part of that conversation and particularly amongst young people who we are all desperate to get on board into politics. It's in our own interests to do that, they would see that they would have a voice, whereas currently they don't. They regard it as an impenetrable fog, and I think PR would give them the opportunity to have a voice. So that's why I support this motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Britton. Thank you, Chair. I'm, go I'm going to support this motion. Um, but I would like to highlight a point about local elections. I was very fortunate in the local election to have three votes, um, which is great. Unfortunately, Councillor Hopewell, uh, over there, for example, only, only got two votes. And poor Councillor Hoskin only got one vote. So I think if it's going to be used in, in local elections, it actually would require a wholesale change in the way local elections are done, because the existing wards arrangement wouldn't, wouldn't work with a, with a straight, straight PR. So following on from that, obviously the statistics about how previous elections might have turned out under PR are kind of meaningless because it wasn't really a kind of fair test in, in that sense. So, so, but there have obviously been injustices. I think there's actually a very good case for everybody in this room to support, to support this. Um, obviously PR generally is a system that helps the minor parties in, in this council. The Labour Party probably would be the party that would have been most benefited by it in the local elections most recently. We've got a general election coming up in the next 13 months. The Conservative Party would probably find they'll get more, more seats in the national election with PR than they would under first past the post. And the Liberal Democrats, they, they also probably have lost seats in the le recent local elections. So, so you know, it's all credit to them for proposing something that, that would have harmed them. The more serious point, though, is, is actually about the right of the individual to have a meaningful vote, and I'm just taking on Miney's point there. I, I'm very much the same. I've never had a meaningful vote in the general election, and obviously, fortunately, local, local elections are slightly different, but general elections, I've never had a meaningful vote. It's estimated that 70% of the population don't have a meaningful vote, which is obviously a, a large amount of the population. Um, and, and what that causes, it causes a... a, a distortion of democracy because what happens is people vote tactically and a survey suggested that one in three voters in the general election in 2019 voted for a party they don't actually support. By, by having PR you remove that incentive to, uh, and, and therefore people will support the party they generally, generally support and you'll get better representation. A poll, a poll in September revealed apparently 60% of Green Party members did, did not did not su support the Green Party in, in the election. So it, it doesn't lead to representative democracy. Um, so having proportional representation of some form uh, would, would just give every, every citizen an equal say. And I just think everybody should support, support this motion in, in the interest of fairness. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, can, I, can I take uh, Councillor Williams and Councillor uh, Wiley first and then, then come to you, Councillor Deering? Yeah, Councillor Williams. Ah, thank you very much. Um, so, 
I'm going to stun everyone as a Green, and I would vote to make us the second largest party by supporting PR. Um, my reasons for that are quite simple. I think the best way I can explain it is that first past the post, in my mind, creates what I would call a negative democracy, where you are most of the time voting against what you don't believe in rather than voting for what you do. And I think that obviously isn't very good. Um, I do a lot of canvassing in where I find reform voters who will vote conservative purely because they so hate the Labour Party. In 2024, there's probably going to be a lot of Greens who will vote Labour because they so hate the Conservatives and they'll hold their nose to do it. And in 2023, I can confirm that many Labour voters and my partner held their nose and voted for me um, against their will, um, which isn't very good for anyone. And when you're doing that, you know, people aren't having their opinion be really expressed. Um, you're going to get a build up of resentment and ultimately disengagement. Um, so when a lot of people aren't voting, we're all voted in, obviously, but we aren't voted in by everyone, so we can't truly represent everyone. So in 2019, it was like 66% of people voted. That means if the Conservatives, even one half of that percentage, they would only represent a third of the people with a majority, 66% of people basically having their views unexpressed. And then another big problem I have is that if you look at Parliament, and then you look at prospective parliament, you will see a suited, faceless, grey mush. And I don't think residents in where priorities should have to choose in parliamentary terms between two different shades of grey mush. I'm a believer in a big rainbow parliament of many blues, greens, yellows, and red. Um, that is pretty much my opinion. So thank you for that. Councillor Wyatt. Thank you, Chairman. I know mine, he said, if you were a Conservative and you stand here, you, you, you will get in. Well, I've got 34 colleagues who would probably disagree with her because they're not sitting here. Um, we've heard this evening about being a listening council in public consultation. In 2011, we had just that. We had a thing called a referendum, and 68% of those who voted said they didn't want PR. So surely we should be listening to that, the fact that we have actually done it a few years ago, and they said, no, thank you. I never really understand the Lib Dem's obsession with PR because it doesn't help them. Scotland, Scottish Parliament, has PR. There's four Lib Dems out of 129. Wales has PR that has one out of 60. And London, where you would expect them to do well because they've actually got MPs, they've got two Lib Dems out of 25. So PR doesn't actually help the Lib Dems. If I was a Lib Dem, I'd stick with first past the post because they're probably going to do better with it. OK, Councillor Deering. Uh, yeah, uh, very briefly, I'm conscious yes. of the time, which is part of our point, really. Um, th we, we accept this motion is well-intentioned, but I'm afraid we don't accept that this is East Hearts District Council business. Um, so uh, I, at least, and I believe most members of my group, will vote against this motion. Uh, and the second reason we will do it is because, as Eric said a few moments ago, uh, the um, coalition sitting opposite us, uh, in terms of all coming together, uh, does not put its money where its mouth is. Um, we were not invited into any coalition. Uh, it's not simply that we were not invited onto the Old River Lane Board. We were denied a place on the Old River Lane Board. So um, you don't believe in what you're... Well, you don't believe in the motion. So it's not appropriate for this council, um, and I, at least, will be voting against it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that ends the debate. Councillor Swainson, you're right to reply. Thank you, yes. Just very briefly. Um, I'm sure Councillor Buckmaster <coughs> will take this in, in the light of, I will be making a political comment in, in response to his. I think it's pretty evident that first past the post doesn't always deliver a strong, stable government. We've only got to look at Parliament for the last yeah. few years to, to know that, you know. Um, for me, and I accept that we might not do brilliantly well out of it, but it is about resident engagement for me. We don't engage enough voters, particularly in local, local politics, and I do think we should try and encourage people to understand that their vote will count. Um, yep, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So if we can move to the, to the vote. Um, can I see, um, by a show of hands, those in, in favour of this motion? Those against? And any abstentions? 
Okay, thank you. That motion is carried. Um, I think probably before we go on to the next motion, which is the last item of, of business, we should have a vote on whether we wish to go on beyond 10 o'clock. Um, Can I propose that, Chairman? Propose, propose that we go on beyond 10 o'clock. Is there a 20, second? 20 minute extension maximum for that? I would, I, would th I would hope that it would be less than that, but yes. Um, I'll second. Okay, second. Those in favour? Okay, those against? I think that is carried. Um, so I will invite Councillor um, Goldspink, but bearing in mind the time, if we can keep things very brief. All right. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, I'm very happy to propose this motion. The, the headline is slightly misleading. It does say motion on hotels for asylum seekers. It should say also and for refugees. It is about refugees as well as asylum seekers. Okay. Um, I will read it so that if anybody watching or listening can understand what I'm talking about. This council notes with concern that the government and the Home Office are now planning to close 50 of the hotels which are currently housing asylum seekers on the 1st of January 2024. Um, um, it is also requiring that the asylum seekers who are now accepted as refugees should leave their hotels almost immediately. This council also notes that the local government association, the LGA, has written to the immigration minister, who was Robert Jenrick, expressing its concerns about the challenges which those people who are having to leave the hotels will face in finding long-term affordable accommodation. Many of those who are now refugees will be at risk of homelessness and rough sleeping. The estimate is 50,000 at least. The LGA's letter called for a joint and funded approach, nationally and locally, to manage the transition from asylum accommodation to independent living. It also caused for a pause in asylum seat support cessations over the Christmas week and during extreme cold weather to reduce the risk of street homelessness. East Hearts has many Ukrainian refugees who are looking for accommodation and their chances of finding homes could be seriously affected by this sudden rise in the number of new refugee homeless and rough sleepers. This council therefore resolves to write to the immigration minister stating its full support for the letter which was sent by the LGA. I was delighted that the LGA had sent this letter um, because uh, it seems to me that it is so cruel and inhumane to require asylum seekers who have now been assessed as being refugees and they're given the leave to, to remain here in this country, they're being required at such short notice um, that they must leave their hotels. And sometimes the letter which tells them the good news that they, can, they are now refugees, they can remain here um, and they can earn their living and they can contribute to society. This letter with really good news is, is often um, delayed in the post, but then when it arrives, the, the person, the new refugee, has only 28 days, which is reduced in the post, in which to... Uh, um, apply for a bank account, apply for income support, um, and to do any of those things, he or she has to have um, uh, the, uh, the, the visa identification. And if that has not come, they cannot even begin on this process. So they suddenly find that they're out on the streets, homeless. Um, if it is a family of refugees, then the district council does have a duty to, to house them. Probably in a hotel, yes, very expensive for bed and breakfast. If it's a single person who's fit and well, he or she will receive um, none of this help at all. So the LGA, in its letter to the immigration minister, has raised these concerns. Um, and on behalf of all the councils, the LGA is asking for urgent funding to help councils put in place local support to minimize the risk of destitution, overcrowding, and street homelessness. The LGA is asking that the, the government should make sure that people have the full 28 days notice that they have been promised before they have to leave the home office accommodation. 
LG is calling for shared information about how many cases each local authority will have to support to help with our local planning. The LG is causing for a pause in the asylum support cessations over the Christmas week and during extreme weather to re reduce the risk of street homelessness. It seems to be particularly inhumane and cruel to be making people homeless in this cold weather. The LGA also calls for ur urgently, the government urgently uprate the local housing allowance rate that determines the subsidy available for temporary accommodation. This has remained capped at 90% of the 211 rates. The LGA calls for a commitment to future resources for council support, for those still waiting for a decision on the claims as part of the local government finance settlement in the new year. So I was very, very pleased that the LGA had sent this letter. I fully support it, um, and I do ask for people's support for the motion that we do send a letter um, to the immigration minister and the government stating our full support for the letter which was sent by the local government association. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a seconder to that motion? Councillor Townsend, do you wish to speak or reserve your right? Okay, thank you. Are there any other speakers in this debate? Councillor Deering. Thank you very much, Chairman. But perhaps I should just say that, I, I, again, we accept this as a well-intentioned motion, but it, it it's barely East Hearts Council business. So, um, and of course, there will be quite a lot of our taxpayers who will be saying to themselves that they should not be bearing the cost of, uh, of, of what is proposed here. So we will be abstaining on this, uh, m primarily because uh, this is barely East Hearts business. And if I might say, particularly at this time of night, can we be judgmental as to what we bring into the chamber, uh, it should be council business and not, broadly speaking, business of national politics. Um, we're here to deal with East Hearts Council matters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Redfern. This absolutely is an East Hearts Council matter because we are providing money for refugees it, and it is our local authority's duty to care for homeless people and sleep, street sweep, sleepers. So how can you possibly argue that it isn't a local matter? Um, I absolutely refute what Councillor Deering just said. And it is national politics, but it is also local politics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Devonshire. Thank you, Chair. I agree with uh, Councillor Deering. This is nothing to do with East Hearts. I fully, 100%, I'm behind looking after the homeless and rough sleepers. I'm 2,000% behind that. However, I don't think this is going to change anything. And uh, Councillor Deering is quite right. This time of night, what we're going to achieve here, I really don't think this motion is going to achieve much at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, Councillor Dahl. Thank you for bringing the motion, Myoni. I do support it. I think that the chaotic nature of this government and at the same time putting local councils in double bind with shrinking funds, we need to tell them that this is not acceptable. Thank you. Councillor Tepper. Thank you, Chair. Um, I notice on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis, certainly across Bishop Stortford, certainly across other towns very close by, uh, I don't know about Hartford, but I suspect it may be the same. But the increase in the number of people that are living rough and uh, seeking constantly somewhere to go that's warm and safe, seeking somewhere they can pitch a tent without being beaten up during the night, etc., is increasing over and over again. Just in one location recently, I know we initially had two, then three, now there's nine on a daily basis looking for just somewhere to stay because they don't fit into the criteria where they can get help. Those that are in hotels, they're kicked out in the morning sometimes, they have nowhere else to go, and they're wandering the streets looking for something to do and somewhere safe to exist for that day. And that, of course, will encourage the those that are suffering the most to perhaps sink into petty crime if they have no means to finance themselves and they don't have any money to support themselves it's going to be an increasing business. And I would definitely dispute the fact that it's not an East Hearts problem. It is a national problem, yes, but 
we've got more and more and more people in our area that are coming, becoming almost destitute and very, very rapidly. And believe me, there are very few people probably in the whole area that aren't only one or two paychecks away from a serious situation themselves. So I would ask you to consider that very carefully. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Councillor Williams. So one, and again, I'm not sure this entirely applies to East Hearts, but I know many councils up and down the country flew the Ukrainian flag during the period of invasion. And that, to me, sets a precedent that councils have a duty to decide whether or not they want to stand up for those same people who they were supporting back then. Um, and that is pretty much all I've got to say. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure that the well, Ukrainians are, I think, mentioned in the in the in the in the motion, so that's okay. Um, is that all the the contributions? If we can, perhaps, uh, well, mind if you've got a right to reply. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, thank you for your comments, everybody. Um, yes, this is a, a matter for uh, East Hertfordshire. Um, East Hertfordshire is a member of the Local Government Association, and it is the Local Government Association which has made these comments and which is asking central government for help. Um, there are Ukrainian refugees in East Hearts. So there are many in Bishop Stortford. Um, I'm delighted that our housing department has been able to house some of them, but not all of them. But now, since the Home Office has suddenly assessed and been tackling the backlog of all these asylum seekers in their hotels, and I'm glad they have suddenly assessed, but there's suddenly a huge number who have been assessed and have been given right to stay, to remain. Um, and then they're given such short notice and turned out onto the streets. And this is a burden on all local councils. And the local government association has, has realized this, and that's why it sent its letter to the immigration minister. Since we are a member of the local government association, I think it is quite appropriate for us to say whether or not we approve of what they're doing, whether we support it or not. And I personally support it very strongly. I was delighted to see that they had picked it up and they were making comments. And, and they did want this country to um, be hospitable to refugees, to help them. Many of them highly, highly qualified, and they really want to um, contribute to the community. They will bring great be benefit to our country. So, um, all right, we have to pay for them for a little while while they get on their feet, but then they will really contribute and bring great benefit to us. So I do think we should support them. We're supposed to have a, a proud tradition in this country of, of being um, welcoming to asylum seekers, people who are fleeing from wars and torture and indescribable conditions. So I do think we should keep up with that tradition, and I do think we should say to the local government association, we're very glad that you have made these requests, um, and we fully support them. So I ask for your support for the motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. So if we um, we move to the vote, members, the, the motion is set out on page 341 of the agenda pack. Uh, and could we have a show of hands, uh, those who are in favour of the motion? Those who are against? And any abstentions? OK, thank you. That motion is carried. Uh, members, that concludes tonight's business. So I declare the meeting closed um, and I wish you all uh, a happy Christmas and a, a new year period, however you, you um, celebrate that. And um, there are refreshments downstairs. Uh, I think there are still refreshments downstairs if any of you have the stamina to remain. So thank you very much. <laughs>